Okay. Uh, so thank you, John. Um, my name is Dana Matisse. Um, I've been in workers' comp for 20 years. Um, so if you've been in this industry for a short while, then you'll know, uh, quickly realize it is a black hole that sucks you in that you can't get out of. But it is a wonderful family network as large as it may be. Um, like we have people in handle Alabama claims from and live in California. Um, as large as it may be, it's still a small community um, and that I consider family. So um, I've done everything from underwriting to premium audits to claims um, adjusting. So I've been an adjuster for over 15 years now. Um, I've done a I've been a claims adjuster, I've been an EDI data analyst with NCCI and also EDI and also um, a claims manager. So currently working at CCMSI handling trucker claims out of Tennessee, so I'm actually not handling Alabama now, but I did for a really long time. Um, married, have four kids and two dogs, and I think that's about it about me. So. Thank y'all. First of all, can y'all hear me okay with this? Can y'all, everybody in the back, can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So my name is John Webb. Um, I'm a partner at Lloyd Gray Whitehead and Monroe. Um, I'm the head of our work comp practice group. I'm also the head of our fraud and special investigative unit practice group. Been doing workers comp for just like Dana for over 20 years. Um, uh, graduated from the University of Alabama undergrad and law school, just got there and kind of stuck with it. Um, on the trial team there, we won the national championship while I was there on the trial team. Um, past president of the um, Birmingham Bar Work Comp section. Uh, just have been very involved in work comp from the very beginning of my practice. Um, it's a um, a lot of people think workers' comp is just kind of the same thing, and there are some things that are patterns that you see, but I've been doing it for 20 years, and I have a, you know, a group that works under me, and we round table things every week. You know, something will come up, there are always nuances, and there are differences and things that come up, which to me makes it interesting. It kind of keeps you mm -hmm. interested in the, in the type of work that you're doing. Um, I've uh, married, got two kids, I got one that's a sophomore at Alabama, and my son is a, a senior in high school uh, here in Birmingham, and uh, he's looking forward to starting the basketball season next week. So, um, but we'll we'll probably go for 45 minutes to an hour, take a break. We're here for I think three and a half hours. So, last year Dana and I did not get finished with this, and I told her this morning I thought, well, maybe last year was like two hours, and they just reminded me, no, it was three and a half hours. So. <laughs> Um, we'll try to move along. I think, you know, some topics bear more conversation and, and I would also really encourage you, this is very informal, you know, if we're talking about a topic, let's go, ask a question right then. There's no need to try to wait till the very end of this since we're going to be here so long. So if we're talking about something that you're, you have a question about or that you're interested in, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, we'll cover it right there. And again, Please don't be, you know, nervous to ask a question. All questions are good questions. You may ask something that I don't know the answer to. Um, so, um, but uh, we look forward to being with you here today. And again, just feel free to, to interact. The more you, we interact with each other, I think the more that the group will get out of, get out of this exercise. Um, before we get started, how many, um, how many people are from out of state? Okay. All right. How many Alabama people do we have? Okay, it's about about half and half. Um, um, how many people have been working doing work comp for less than a year? Okay. All right. We've got some people with a little more experience. Some people with not as much. So, um, well, great. Well, let, without further ado, let's let's kind of get started. I will say that when. We were asked to do this, and John and I kind of talked. Um, they said that new adjuster training, you know, obviously it's based on Alabama, but it is for new adjusters. So when we did this, we kind of did it in mind for new adjusters, but applying 
Alabama law to the process of how to handle claims. Um, so just bear that in mind. We'll try to focus more on some of the things, you know, or talk more about some of the things that some of you more senior related gestures may be interested in and wanting to know. Um, I know that some of that may be particular case law and calculations and so forth, so. And Dana, this is really kind of your area. Um, initial claim reporting and set up. So that, I'm gonna let Dana kind of talk to us about that. Right. So this first page, a lot of it's gonna be your basic information about when a claim comes in, what to do. Um, you know, the Alabama claim, obviously you've got your Alabama first report of injury form. Most of your documents and your handouts you will find in, in this. Um, all Alabama claims are required to report um, if they're lost time via EDI. So that is your notice to the state. Med onlys, you will hear Earlene or Peggy or Christine or any of them tell you if they are med only, they don't want it. Um, so don't have to report med onlys to the state. You only report lost time claims to the state via EDI. Um, so they are all due, first reports of injury for lost time claims are all due to the Department of Labor 15 days after the notice of injury um, or knowledge thereof by the employer. Um, if you start benefits, that's gonna be, I guess, what we call that second report of injury or the SHROI. Um, in the Alabama state forms, before we went via EDI, it was called the Combination Supplementary and Claim Summary Form. Um, so those are gonna be required upon making that first payment of compensation due within 10 days via EDI. Um, due if litigation is filed. If a claim is denied, you must find a reason for denial. Um, you have to submit your suspension on cessation or termination of benefits. Um, that's also due within 10 days. Thankfully, um, state does not, you know, yet to impose any type of penalties for any late filings like, you know, many of you may experience in other states if you don't have something filed timely. Um, so thankfully they're not there yet and hopefully they won't be there. Um, but if you do do a filing wrong, you will quickly get a notice from Peggy or Erlene still that say rejected or, you know, um, this is past due and you need to file it. You, you're not sending benefits. Um, so there's your first report of injury. There's a sample form in there and you guys can go through that. I'm not gonna go through that. Um, your sub there's more information about your subsequent state filings, your combination supplementary forms for EDI requirements. Um, if you need to know that because unfortunately every state is different in what you have to file. Um, I do Tennessee, Tennessee is, you know, we, we do a lot of filings for Tennessee for everything. Um, so you will have periodic filings that are due. So obviously you're gonna do your initial payment and you're gonna do um, your suspension of benefits, but you're also gonna have a bi-monthly that's due, which is 40 to 45 days after that first report if you never started benefits. So let's say, hey, I'm going to, this is a lost time claim, I'm gonna send it to the state of Tennessee or no, sorry, state of Alabama, um, and we're not paying any TTD or anything like that, but I've gotta file it because he's got a rating and now I've gotta settle that claim or something like that. Um, until you have settled that claim and that settlement is filed, you are required to file a bi-monthly bi report with the state of Alabama every 40 to 45 days. Um, the sub-annual report is due every six months um, after the first payment until you file, uh, of benefits that starts until a suspension has been filed. I know a lot of this may be just kind of nuanced because a lot of people work for companies that have EDI teams that manage that and you don't have to deal with that, but believe it or not, there are companies out there who don't. Um, and I've been, and I've worked for many of them. So, it, you know, at the end of the day, it is, to me, it is the registrar's responsibility to make sure all your filings have been handled and filed appropriately with the state. Um, you do have a final report due at the time of closure, and you also have to, you know, report your um, settlement if you have a settlement to the state of Alabama. So. Um, here are just some informations regarding state forms, um, contacts. If you have a question or rejection, you need to contact either of them. Most of everybody should have Peggy's email. 
Um, all right, so types of claims. You want, you want me to keep going? Um, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. All right, so again, these are your basic types of claims. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, like John said, we ran out of time last year. Um, you have your notice only, your mat only, indemnity, lost time claims. You have a denied claim. You have an employer's liability claim, occupational illness and fatality. I think most everybody should know what each of those means. If you don't, you can please feel free to ask questions. Indemnity and lost time claim when an injured worker is paid for time for being out of work, whether it's temporary total or temporary partial benefits um, or an impair impairment rating. Um, you have a three-day waiting period in Alabama before benefits start. So if an employee is out of work for four days, it's considered a lost time claim. Um, so denied claim, you def denied it with the state of Alabama. We don't see a lot of employer liability claims because work comp is exclusive remedy. Um, and occupational illness, again, those are tons of things that we, we see a lot of, but I know John's probably experienced that more because of black, he's done a lot of black yeah, and stuff. Yeah, I should have stuff, mentioned but. that, and I didn't mention it when I was introducing myself, but I, I do a lot of, um, it's not state work comp, so it's kind of a different area, but you, it's called, a, it's a federal black lung work. So black lung disease, also, the, I guess the technical name is pneumoconiosis, some of y'all may be familiar with that or have heard of it. Um, so obviously representing mostly coal mines um, with those types of claims. And so the, whole, the federal system is, it's an administrative system and it's not in state court, but you can have those same types of claims, breathing related claims in state court, um, you know, under the work comp system. So, um, I do. I think they're kind of rare. I do a lot of them just because I represent coal, a lot of coal mines. Um, and, but but generally, you don't see a, a ton of those types of, of claims. I've had alleged claims. Um, you know, radiation exposure and skin cancer. You know, wanted to file a claim for skin cancer. Um, obviously, that burden in Alabama can be a little challenging to prove on occupational illness. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is the burden in Alabama on them? Well, it's it's the it's the same. It's a preponderance burden. I mean, it's the same burden you have. I mean, it's um, if it's a cumulative trauma, which also can be an occupational disease. If it's a cumulative trauma, and so you got two different types of. You can have an acute injury. Somebody um, slips down, falls, breaks their leg. Okay, they've got an <coughs> acute injury to their leg, or you can have something that develops over time cumulatively, day after day after day, you're exposed to something. Kind of one of the most common that you see is um, carpal tunnel. You know, it just it doesn't happen one day, although carpal tunnel can happen acutely. Acute. I mean, you can get an injury to your wrist and you can have an acute injury that causes carpal tunnel. Most of the time you see it though over time where they're doing some repetitive work on a, an assembly line or sewing or something like that. And you just, over time, and so, um, those claims do have a higher burden um, to prove. It's, it's more difficult for the plaintiff. You have to show clear and convincing evidence in any time of cumulative trauma that happens over time. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, if it, it's not something that was a documented accident, you need to make sure that they're, this really, your work really caused it. So they have a higher burden. They have to show that, you know, your employment from working on that assembly line day after day after day caused your carpal tunnel and you have to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. An acute injury is, has to be proven only by a preponderance of the evidence. They just kind of have to barely, you know, tip the scale, so to speak. But with clear and convincing, it's a much higher burden that they have to show. So those claims, um, you know, a lot of times we're more aggressive with defending those claims just because they do have a higher burden of trying to establish um, that that is connected to their employment. And, you know, for example, with carpal tunnel, there can be many other causes of that. So, you know, during discovery, you would send, you know, interrogatories asking about other issues that could have caused the carpal tunnel. And that's just one example of the occupational disease. 
Um, and fatality, I guess, is the last one. Right, and that's just, you know, ultimately your death claim. I think we'll talk about that a little more. We've got some more slides regarding some of that. So. And, and denied claims, I would say, um, is this is this still okay? Is y'all can y'all is this too loud or loud enough? Just right. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, you know, denied claims we've got here. You know, it is on a denied claim. You definitely need to make sure that you communicate in detail to the um, to the claimant. You know that the claim is denied. Mm -hmm. And generally, you want to give you know some expl you know an explanation as to why. A lot of times. I'm involved in those claims, so Dana gets a claim, there's a question about it, is this really compensable or not, sends it to me, they've maybe done the recorded interview, kind of done an investigation, sometimes maybe we assist with that, depending on kind of how far the investigation got, and we'll do what I call a kind of a legal opinion regarding compensability. So we'll look at all the facts, we'll identify the legal issues, and we will you know, make a determination as to whether we believe it's compensable under the Alabama Work Compact. And so once, let's say I've, I've looked at it and I say, mm, I, I don't think this is compensable, um, or there are, here are three defenses that are valid defenses of this claim um, that we can assert in this case, then I would generally prepare a um, kind of a draft denial letter for Dana that she can send out under over her letterhead, um, so you know, with a you don't want to you don't you don't want to be a two-page denial letter, but you know you want to give them enough information um, to you know explain hey we've investigated this thoroughly, um, you know we found these are some facts that we found, and based on this law, you know your claim is being denied, um, you know sometimes. People will reference, you know, if you need medical treatment, you may want to turn this into your, you know, um, health care provider as opposed to workers' comp. So, um, you know, it's just a little bit of information on the denied claim part where typically I'm, I would be a little more involved, you know, on that part of it. A lot of times I end all of my denials saying, if you have more information, please provide it because it always kind of gives them a little, a little out. So, um, and, and to say, if there's something that I'm missing or that you have additional information, please provide it for reconsideration. Henry? <coughs> have you ever discussed in more detail about workers' code and video tapping? Henry later. Yeah. I think so. I think I'm trying it's to in remember here. if there's a slide on that. Um, but I'm not sure we have one on idiopathic, Henry, but that's a, it's a good question and it's an issue that does come up a good bit. Um, so, you know, idiopathic injuries, I'm trying to think of the seminal case. Um, this, it was uh, Slimfold is the case. Henry's got me, put me on the spot. I got to remember a, a case. Um, <laughs> so, I think it might help just to kind of give you an example of what an idiopathic injury is like. So, it's essentially some underlying condition that's unique to you causes the accident or injury and it's not something that's connected to your employment. So the, the Slimfold case, um, a man was standing at the copier, if I remember this right, standing at a copier making copies and he lost consciousness and he fell down, hit his head and if I remember right, I think he ended up dying or he had some very significant head injury, I think he died. Um, this case has been out for a long time. Um, so when they started looking into it, you know, it seemed like, okay, he's doing a, a task at work, um, falls over his, his head, turns the claim in, you're thinking, hmm, you know, this could be related. Well, they start digging into it, and he had, um, had some alcohol-related um, cirrhosis issues and issues that caused him to lose consciousness. That's what caused him to lose consciousness not the making copies, okay? Um, which, that may have been part of the tip-off, is like, you know, just standing there making copies, you're not exerting yourself and things like that. So, ultimately the court said that that was an idiopathic injury that was not compensable because it was related to his underlying cirrhosis of the liver condition that caused him to lose consciousness and fall and hit his head. Um, 
we see a lot of those cases um, mm -hmm. actually, um, and but that's a great question, Henry. Um, and I, I can't remember. I don't think we have a, a slide on idiopathic, so that's a good time to I, go ahead yeah, and cover it. It may be in here somewhere. I know I've, I've had one on kind of the reverse side where um, employee was on top of a roof and he was doing roofing work. He was a maintenance guy at a um, nursing home type facility and he was up there doing some work, had a heart attack, caused him to fall off the roof and land on the ground. So first thought obviously is well that's personal condition and that's not therefore you know related but then there's the but for um, his job placed him on a roof and had he not been on the roof then he could have survived that heart attack um, so and then in that situation we resulted in paying for it and then um, I've also had one where a guy passed out driving a car but he was a police officer um, and then, you know, we had that question that said, well, does his job put him at an increased risk because he was behind the wheel of a vehicle? Um, and I know sometimes that's the case with, you know, where there like any kind of truck drivers or anything like that, does his job put him at an increased risk because he's behind the vehicle or, you know, driving a vehicle? Um, and, and to me, that one's a lot more gray because people drive all day long so I don't really consider that your job puts you at an increased risk because um, you could have been driving your personal vehicle it's just like walking on a sidewalk so some attorneys may disagree with that aspect or that particular case you know but me personally I don't, I don't really see that one as an increased risk it's just what I would call a muddy situation it's best to find a way to deny it but pay him some money and get out of it if you can. Well, well one other example before we leave this um, we had a case this was years back where um, the employee got off work and so he's walking down stairs as he's leaving the job site he was still technically on the premises it wasn't a question about whether he had clocked out or anything like that but so he's walking down the stairs and he falls and has a pretty bad injury. Um, and so we denied the claim um, based on idiopathic because people in their everyday life walk up and down stairs, okay? Um, but as we dug into it and we, we did discovery, we found out that he actually already had a torn meniscus and had, had the doctors had request, suggested he get it repaired and he never did. So he's walking around with a torn meniscus and he injured his knee as part of the accident. But we found out that he'd already had an injury, a knee injury. So our position was, you know, the reason that he fell down the stairs was something unique to him. He already had a torn meniscus in his knee and it, his knee, as he stepped down, his knee buckled and it made him fall. So we ended up having, we tried that case up in Madison County, which is a, a good venue for us, but um, when we were successful on that one, but um, that's another example of something that was unique to that employee that caused the accident. It wasn't him having to negotiate down these stairs. Um, so anybody have any questions about that before we kind of move on? Okay. Say that one more time. The three-day waiting period, is that retroactive? Retroactive. So after 21 days, you go yeah. back and pay the pay first the, three. Yeah. Seven-day work week. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, I think we're moving on to yep. who is considered an employee. Um, every, Those are pretty basic, but yeah. What's that? I said these are pretty basic. I mean, most people, a yeah. lot of people should know these, but yeah. yeah. Generally, these are not real. We don't get in. These usually don't become real issues. But anyway, we're we're kind of kind of going through the nuts and bolts. So, who is considered an employee? It's every person in the service of another under contract of hire, and that can be. It doesn't have to be in writing. It can be written. It can be oral. Um, it can be expressly. You know, an express agreement. It can be just implied. It. You know. A lot of things are going to um, qualify as being an employee. If you're, you know, in the service of, no, of another, um, it can include, you know, what I would call 1099, you know, independent contractors. And people think, well, it says they're an independent contractor, but it can still include 1099 workers 
A lot of people think, well, they're paid by 1099, they're an independent contractor, but they can still be employees. Um, that's kind of a whole, a whole nother topic. But I mean, basically, um, if you reserve the right to control that person, then they are going to be your employee, regardless if you're paying them with a 1099. Um, there are a list of, of, um, of um, issues that if you, if you end up with a, a 1099 worker, or, you know, let's say you, Dana gets a claim in and um, she's talking to the employer and they say, well, hold on a second, this guy didn't, he didn't work for me, he was a, an independent contractor, I paid him by 1099. Hotels, they say all the time. <laughs> there are certain things that you want to, you know, find out. You want to find out, you know, how did you pay them? Um, you know, did they provide their own tools um, or did you provide those tools for them? Um, obviously, if they're providing their own tools and they go to a job site and they're doing, say, sheetrock somewhere and they're bringing all their own equipment, well, that kind of makes you seem like you're more of an independent contractor than, than an employee. Um, but it really boils down to the reserved right of control. So if I can tell that sheetrocker, you're gonna be on this job on this time, these days, this is how you're gonna do the job. Maybe they've got somebody kind of supervising them. That tends to be more um, an employee, right? And if it's just Bill's sheetrocking company and they, the, the, the employer calls up and says, okay, we need to have the third floor of this thing sheetrocked. And that's really the only connection. And Bill has all his crew, all his equipment, you know, all of those things, and they decide when they go, how they do it, that's gonna be more on the end of an, of an independent contractor. Um, so, you know, I talked about the fact that Work Comp always has, you know, kind of a lot of these gray areas, and that's one of the things. You just have to look at all the specifics of each case and then make a determination of, you know, which way, you know, does this go. And you can have a, a situation that's very similar. You think, okay, well, this is kind of like that other situation, but just one little thing might be different that could kind of flip it, um, you know, on its head. So that's a little bit about, you know, 1099 workers, whether they're an employee or, or, or not. Well, I would throw a scenario and I'll show of hands. So I had an excavation company, signed the excavation, you know, um, and hired someone and guys uh, with a shake of a hand, $100 a day was the way that the, the agreement went down. And on his very first day, put them on a roof to do roofing, which by the way, the insurance company does not write roofers. Um, and that is actually an exclusion. <laughs> um, on his very first day on a roof, he falls 25 feet and suffers a massive TBI, transfer to UAB, ends up in Shepherd Center to be a multi-million dollar claim. Who, who thinks that it's compensable? Really? Nobody. Dang, I paid two and a half million dollars for nothing. <laughs> Uh, you, you think it's compensable, okay? So why would you, did, why, I mean, just out of curiosity, why would somebody, why do you think it's not compensable? Nobody? All y'all don't think it's compensable, nobody knows why though? They don't write? Well, well, I mean, technically it doesn't write roofers. But can you fight that? Is it the employee's fault that they, that they put them on a roof? Yeah. You know, in Alabama, that's one of the things that you'll learn, you know, doing Alabama is because they're not, we're not governed or commit, you know, we don't have a work comp commission, even though, I mean, I'm, you know, if Mr. Levins gets up there, I'm, you know, tell him to fight for that, uh, try to get us a commission or something if we can, but, um, you know, and I've learned being in other states that I love having a commission versus trying to figure out what every five judges in every county is going to possibly answer the way they're going to answer. So sometimes your jurisdiction really depends on maybe how you answer that question. It, it's one of the biggest things you look at, yeah. honestly. You know, um, you kind of want to know where the case is and, and ultimately you're going to be in front of a judge there. So my job is to know what judges are in which county and are they conservative, are they plaintiff friendly, or they, you know, they middle down the road, you know, and so that can definitely inform your decision in terms of how you're handling some of these things. 
um, it can it can be an important topic. Well, when you go and look at, you know, if you're having to look at a policy, and I know some people do self-insurance, so maybe you don't do that a whole lot, but if you're having to look at a policy and apply where, um, you know, apply the policy to, to determining compensability, and you're looking at that and you say, well, um, you know, we don't write roofers, and I, I agree with that. We don't write roofers, but, you know, this Joe who owns Joe's Excavating, he didn't know that, you know, and he just, the place that he was working at had something going on with the roof, and, you know, um, Alan comes out and says, hey, we, can you get up there and, and do this also while you're out here doing this excavation on my roof? And he goes, oh, yeah, sure, why not, you know, and so he goes and hires Rex, you know, and says, hey, Rex, you know, I'll pay you $100 a day if you get up there and do that. And on the first day of Rex's employment, he falls 25 feet. I can't prove anything on that. I can't prove anything on the employer's part because there was no ill will to, def you know, to defraud me. He didn't know. He just didn't know. And, and that raises a, a, an issue from the legal standpoint of that's getting into a coverage issue so with the insurance coverage which is different from compensability so mm -hmm. compensability is you know is it a compensable claim there are no defenses to this claim we're going to pay this claim okay you know what Dana's is getting into is saying okay well we don't write roofing well that gets into coverage where is there whether there is coverage under the policy um, or not the work comp policy um, whether there's coverage. So that's a separate kind of issue and that's, it can make those things very tricky. But what she's alluding to is, you know, the person that got injured, it's still a compensable injury if it's covered under the policy. You know, and, and again, not to get too into this, but, you know, the work comp carrier would have to hire one attorney to determine mm -hmm. whether there's coverage under the policy and then they would hire another attorney that would defend, if, it, if there is coverage, then they would hire a separate attorney to defend the case, you know, in court, um, the actual work comp case or claim. Um, so those are kind of two different things that um, are separate and you can have a conflict. You can't have the same attorney determining whether there's coverage or not. There's a, there'd be a conflict, so you have to separate those. So I, I don't know. Some of y'all may have dealt with that, and I know this is kind of a, you know, a beginner, more beginner's type um, course, but that that is something that does come up from time to time. Um, and it's just, just, from your perspective, it's just kind of good to be aware of the coverage versus compensability issues. Um, I think we have another slide that will kind of hit on that too. Okay. So. Um, still, we're still talking about, I know we're kind of going off on these little discussions, but I, I think they're helpful. Um, but we're still talking about who is considered an employee. Um, volunteers can be employees. Um, and then aliens and minors legal, legally permitted to work under Alabama law are, are considered employees. One thing that a lot of people um, are somewhat, maybe not so much now, but um, you know, 10 years ago they certainly were. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people would, were su surprised that you know, illegal aliens, people that are here illegally, you know, don't have the proper documentation um, that they can be an employee and those claims are compensable. So, in fact, um, in the definition of employee, alien is used in the definition. I'm, I don't have it exactly here, but um, they can certainly be employees. You can't, you can't hire an illegal alien. I guess you can act like you didn't know, but essentially you can't get the benefit of their work as an employer. Let's say I'm ACME plumbing company. I can't hire somebody that's illegal and get the benefit of their work and then they get hurt and then I turn around and say, well, oh, well, you're, I'm not going to pay you work comp benefits. So it doesn't work like that. Um, there's never, there's not a reported case in Alabama that is directly on point on that issue. Um, and I think the reason is because it's so commonly accepted now that everybody realizes that those claims would be compensable. There was probably 10 years ago there was a local um, order floating around that you know wasn't reported. It was just a local Jefferson County judge that had entered an order kind of explaining why this illegal alien was entitled to benefits. And so 
in my mind at least since that time there really haven't been many questions about it um, it's been kind of a kind of a decided issue and so there is not a a court case a reported case like with Alabama Court of Civil Appeals or the Alabama Supreme Court you know setting out exactly yes illegal aliens are entitled to benefits but they are and they can be employees mm -hmm. um, let's see. who is considered an employer uh, okay, so I have the actual definition here. Uh, an employer is defined as every person who employs another to perform a service for hire and pays wages directly to the person. Um, again, it's a pretty broad um, definition. So if the person is receiving wages, and there's sometimes even if they're not, they're, they're going to be an em you're going to be considered their employer if you're paying them wages. Um, that's kind of what you're looking for in those scenarios. And again, it, it doesn't come up a whole lot. Um, what types of employment are excluded from the requirements to provide workers comp? Um, so domestic servants, so somebody working in somebody's house, um, um, excluded. Farm laborers are excluded. Um, casual employees are excluded. Um, municipal corporations, so county, cities, towns, less than 2,000 people are not ex are excluded. They're not um, governed by the Alabama Work Compact. So if a farm, you know, and let's see, we've got employees covered under federal law. So if those, these, the people in these categories got hurt, they're not governed by the Alabama Work Compact. Now, if you're a farm and you decide you want to be governed by the Work Compact, you can you can buy work comp insurance, and most people do that. So again, this is something I don't see a lot of. Um, most people want to be covered under workers' comp, and this might warrant a, just a quick discussion about kind of the, the work comp system. And, and I'm sure everybody knows this, but so workers' comp is set up, it's a no-fault system, right? So. You know, under tort liability, you hear negligence. Okay, somebody um, was negligent, and then that's how they can then be liable for the injury. Well, under under workers' comp, it's no. You don't have to be the employer. Doesn't have to be negligent. There doesn't have to be any negligence. They're just if you get hurt, you know, at work, you know, generally within the scope and course of your employment. Of course, there's all these defenses, but generally that's going to be covered under work comp, and. So the trade-off is, you know, under negligence, it's harder to show that somebody's liable for an injury. So it's harder to pin that on the, you know, the person that's, that's negligent. But the damages are huge, greater. I mean, for tort damages, you can have pain and suffering, you have punitive damages, and you, know, you can have a million dollar case. Under workers' comp, you don't have to prove negligence. It's no fault. Um, so very easy to get that claim under that system, under the work comp system, but the damages are much lower. They're, they're, they're capped, you know, they're set based off of the average weekly wage and those types of factors. So it, it's most employers want to be under workers comp because their damages are, are, are smaller, you know, and um, they don't want to be exposed to a tort suit um, you know, where you can have punitive damage and things like that. So that's kind of how that the work comp system developed, you know, years and years ago. Um, make it easier for employers to get employees to get benefits, but their damages are, you know, somewhat capped as compared to a tort damage, you know, a negligence case, a wantonness case, things like that. So, um, this. This may be you, Dana. Yeah, that's fine. Um, who can handle claims? Adjusters. Huh. Um, so you can be a, you know, there's a lot of different rules, and but I know there's something that just came out from the state regarding um, the licensing and whether or not you have to have it. I mean, it kind of can matter whether you're working for an insurance company or you're working for a TPA for an insurance company or a TPA handling self-insureds, you know, whether you require the actual um, license, which Alabama doesn't do just a work comp license. They have the property casualty, all lines licensing that you have to do. If you've never done that test, it's horrific. I don't recommend it for anybody. 
because um, learning about crop insurance is probably the worst thing I've ever been in in my life. Um, so I love being in work comp. Um, so just, you know, look at what that, if you're not an Alabama resident, you would have to get a non-resident state license. So you, you, if your state offers a license, you would have to get that license, go to Alabama and get Alabama to reciprocate that. So uh, we won't spend too much time on that. Um, verify coverage within policy terms. So we've already talked about that a little bit, obviously, that you, you need to look at your policy, verify that there was coverage. Um, you know, at the time of the accident, the policy was in force. Um, you know, if a, if a president of the company was the one injured, make sure he was not an excluded officer, you know, so forth. Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot to say that was going to vary from other states here. Just make sure, um, you know, policy was in force. And then if you've got an employee who's out of state, you may want to have to look at whether or not you need a coverage assessment like John talked about. Um, for jurisdictional issues. And, um, and that I, comes up a lot. And let me start to interrupt, but I You're think good. just, we did talk a little bit about this. So, you know, really this coverage, you know, verifying coverage is just making sure, okay, well, the policy started on April 1st, 2022, and it went through April 20, you know, April 1st, 2023. Did it fall within that range? You know, I mean, it wasn't outside. And I've had that happen where, you know, somebody, um, you know, they were really trying to be fraudulent and they tried to backdate an injury into po into the policy period, things like that. It, it's kind of rare, but you do see that sometimes. So it's just basic things like making sure it was in the policy range, you know, the date range. Um, and then another thing is that I see sometimes is that you want to make sure it's the right company. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they will have like, they'll come in and, and get coverage, work comp coverage and they might have be running three businesses out of the same office or plant or whatever. And so you wanna make sure, you know, if your Dana is trying to make sure, okay, this person was really employed for the company that we are providing coverage for. So they might have a lawn maintenance service and then they might have a tree trimming service and they mm -hmm. might have a something else, you know, all operating and I, I, I it's not, that common, but I have seen it a number of times. Becoming more year. common than you think, Neil. Right. So <laughs> you just want to make yeah. sure, and, and, pretend, and Dana could probably speak to this even more than I could, but generally you're going to try to make sure you get those payroll records to show mm -hmm. it, it's coming out on the QuickBooks report or whatever payroll for whoever you're insuring. And it wasn't that they sent the guy that really works for the tree cutting service to go mow grass and he got hurt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to make sure that it's, it's um, you know, you're paying the claim on the, on the, on the employer that you're insuring. Yeah. Um, so those are, I think maybe to me, those are the two main things that you're kind of looking for. Yeah. Verify that federal ID. People are trying to fraud and shift stuff around. I mean, I've, I've had people sell certificates of insurance for $25 um, on the street to pass them out. Um, so people could buy proof of coverage and all of a sudden I'm getting some kind of claim that goes, hey, and I'm like, where did you come from? I mean, and it was, a, you know, it's a mess trying to piece the puzzle together. So, you know, just, just verify all of that. Um, we'll kind of go through, I know we'll have a break coming up in a minute. I'm not going to hit a lot on your, you know, investigate, investigation part just for new adjusters. Just read this because this is kind of the A to Z from claim handling. Um, so we're going to kind of bypass this. So you kind of beginning your initial investigation. Are there red flags? These are great things to look at when you're handling a claim as to red flags and to know whether or not this claim is going to be longer and problematic. Um, so please do not handle claims and you don't know. Um, look over those. Um, recorded statement. I do have a outline in here for a recorded statement if nobody has one a lot of people have their own or their company may have one for them to use but there is one in there with a lot of questions I'm kind of particular about mine because I like them to flow a certain way when I've come into other companies and they are not flowing I don't like it um, so because I like to hit my things at, at a certain way do you know recorded statement is your first bite at the apple of any and every claim and any illegal will tell you that if you're trying to send them a claim to deny or anything like that and you don't have a recorded statement it's just it's just going to be much harder 
um, they're, you know, they're time consuming and, you know, they, they're just, I get it. Um, it takes up a lot of time to do that. And when you get three claims in a day and you're having to take recorded statement on each of them potentially, um, that's a lot. And I, and I do understand. But down the road, um, something comes up and, you know, Joe's trying to add a back on a claim where he hurt his knee and you had that recorded statement and you asked Joe, hey, what body part do you hurt? And he said, my knee. And you say, did any other body parts hurt? And he says, no, you're gonna want that recorded statement. So it's important, you know, to do it and, and it does matter and not having it can be costly. So. It's one of the most important things that I get. I mean, yeah. it, it, I can't really overstate that. I mean, it's um, very, very important to me because it's coming directly from the claimant. It's their own story about what happened. It's not the coworker telling us this is what happened. It's not their boss telling us what happened. It's their version of what happened, and it is very, very important. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a great tool for for us on the legal side when we're trying to defend these claims. So, um, I, you know, you probably know more than this about, but. You know, probably not, I don't know, every single claim doesn't warrant a recorded interview, right. but if you see some of these red flags or there's something coming up, get a recorded interview. If it's a back and a neck, especially on anybody over 40, I would always do one. That's just me. Um, so, I mean, because everybody's got back and neck problems. Um, and I mean, and just just me personally, from my experience, you're going to get more out of, hun you know, with honey than vinegar. So, you know, try not to be confrontational in that um, I've ran ISOs before and I've seen ISOs that have lists of 20 claims and I get on their recorded statement and they're like I've never had a work up claim in my life and when I first started in the industry I would be like lies so that's liar. you know liar <laughs> You're um, and I would and I have totally called them out on it too and I've had them backtrack and everything but you know that's really not the right way to do it you'll catch them and they're lie down the road that's when you kind of send it to handle, legal and be uh, like I can handle that part. here you go um, you know he, he's full of it and he his credibility is shot with me so. I would say this though I mean I do think you know it it's a funny story and I mean you know you, you don't have to catch them in the lie. But if you do know they're lying, what you can do is ask that question a couple of other different ways. ways yeah. So if, if they lie to you the first time, rephrase the question, or, or you can even just say, I just wanna make sure I understand you. You're saying that, right, so you've never injured your left knee, you've never had a prior work comp claim, whatever it is, ask it two or three times, and that way there is no wiggle room. You know, when they, when they come back later and they're trying to change their story so it's not that you're trying to I got you that's really for later and even like for me in a deposition a lot of times I won't do the I got you because I want to hold that for trial yeah. I don't want them to know that we have this information and that right. sometimes it just depends on the situation sometimes you do want them to know maybe you're trying to leverage it for a depos I mean for a, a mediation or something like that and you you want them to know you kind of want their attorney to know that what they're dealing with and it will make it easier to get the case resolved because they know they his attorney then rises oh gosh I got these problems um, but other time again that's just strategic case to case but but sometimes you know I won't I will not do the you know the um, Matlock moment you know where you you, you got them um, you want to wait till trial you don't want to do that in the deposition it's the same thing with a recorded interview that's kind of your deposition you know, so you don't have to let them know that you, you've got them. Um, in fact, sometimes it's better just to, like Dana was saying, I guess if she got more experience, it wasn't like, you know, you're lying to me, you know. I, how about this 2003, you, you know, got hurt Done here it. and you get, you know, go <laughs> I have totally that. read off that ISO. Right. I said, did you ever work here? Oh, yeah, I did work there. Wait, did you have a claim? Uh, uh, no. I'm like, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that on such and such date you didn't injure blah, blah, blah? And they're like, how do you know that? But at that you point know? in time, but now... <laughs> and then that, they go, attorney. <laughs> that, that, a tool is, that tool now has kind of been weakened because now they can, all they have to do is say, oh, I'd forgotten about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So if they lie about right. it in the recorded interview, it's best if you don't correct them, but just verify. Ask it two or three ways, and then if I'm using that, it's just, it's, it's very valuable. So yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm going to shut yeah. up. Um, all right. Uh, who was... Henry Levins. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Henry, to your point, it dovetails with, I get that initial medical record from the first treating doctor, or really maybe sometimes it, you know, maybe the first three appointments they've been to the doctor and they say, well, it's my left knee. And then in the fifth appointment they say, oh, and my right shoulder hurts too. Well, I can do a lot with that. I mean, you know, some judges, you know, kind of going back to the venue you're in, they may give them the benefit of the doubt, but I mean, it gives me a great tool to fight with. So then I can say, well, you, you talked to the, the Dana on, um, you know, this week, you said it was just your left knee. First appointment with Dr. Smith, you said it was your left knee. You, then you went to the orthopedic surgeon and you said it was your left knee. And then now we're six months down the road and you say it's your right shoulder too. It's just, it's not credible, it's not believable. So that's a, that's a very good point. And that information can dovetail sometimes with the medical records that really give us a lot of tools to kind of fight with. Yeah, and I will say too, uh, just piggyback off that, so I love, 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 people don't request those intake papers from the doctor's oh, office, you just get the medical notes, but if you're trying to prove something like that, pick up that phone, call that doctor's office and say, I want the paperwork they signed when they first came in, because it has that body and, and it's got their circle around that knee and no, nothing else or whatever, and so it's just just adding to your defense, it's, building your defense. It is so, gold. Those yep. intake sheets are gold so. because, you know, in a deposition, you know, well, do, you, here's Dr. Smith's note, and the history you gave him is it was just your left knee that was injured. Well, he just didn't record it right. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he didn't hear me, or my left knee was really the thing that was bothering me the most, but my right shoulder was hurting, and I told him that, but it just wasn't as much of a priority. That's what we always hear, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it bears out that the left knee needed surgery and the, you know, the right shoulder wasn't as bad, but generally, so if you go to that intake form and it's told Dana's left knee, doctor's note says left knee, and you circled left knee and nothing else, or you wrote my left knee is hurting? And I, think, I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's, that really, yeah. really helps us. Right. It really does. So those intake forms are gold. We've got a question. Can I tell people more than intake forms might say, I have no idea what happened? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that, that's, Absolutely. Because yeah, well, they, they ask. A lot of them ask, what happened? And that's yeah. where we see, honestly, more of those, the value of them is that, you know, they're now trying to claim it was work-related, and I've got three notes in the file where, it took them three months to tell somebody that was work-related and they've told three people that either it hurt, it, what, it happened at home or they don't know what happened or, right. So those, that's really, right. really valuable. That's, that's another right. very good point. Um, all right, and last one kind of before we go, um, hit a break. So who has the right to direct medical treatment? So, I mean, this is one of the few good things I can, I can say about Alabama. Um, not really, but we do. Um, so we, we have the right to direct medical treatment and directing that medical treatment is everything to your claim and knowing your doctors and knowing, you know, who they are and getting them in with somebody. So um, we absolutely, the employer has a right and we as the adjuster for the employer has the right to direct employees medical treatment and select that authorized training physician. Um, if we fail to do so. Um, injured in, you know, employees care to provide an authorized treating position, then the employer will become responsible for payment for the treatment selected by the employee. So, um, and a lot of times there can be a lot of arguments about that because they you know, say, well, you didn't report it you know, in time or, or whatever, but um, just direct them to a good doctor. So, so let's see. To direct them? Uh, as soon as they report the injury, I would, you know, say to do so. I don't know if there's legally, there's, there's, there's no specific a, there's time. There's not a, you have to provide a medical treatment within 10 days or something. There's nothing, you know, just reasonable to standard. I would I mean, say, like, withholding treatment is going to do you more damage than giving it. Um, and especially if, like, if maybe your claim is under investigation, you don't know that if you want to pay for the claim or not. Um, and I've had one of those before. I, well, I was not the adjuster, but I inherited the file. And um, they withheld medical treatment. So he sought treatment on his own for a back injury. Underwent, uh, ended up, and then they eventually denied it several months later. Underwent multiple surgeries, um, four years back, ended up being paralyzed. 
He, but the doctor that he saw said it was work-related. Well, when you go and, and the claim becomes litigated, guess what? We had no medical opinion to refute his medical opinion because we didn't just direct him to care to somebody that we could have sent him to who would have absolutely said it was never work-related. And it would have made a difference between what ended up being, you know, six figures, probably three to $400,000 settlement to probably much less than that. So um, that's nine o'clock. Yeah, so one, one last, well, that's a, a really good point. And I, I do, there are times when, um, well, first of all, if you, if you pay, and I think we mentioned this later, but just it kind of triggered my thought. If you pay indemnity benefits or start medical treatment, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have accepted the claim as compensable. You can still deny the claim. Okay, so um, it's hard to, there's not a hard and fast rule on that. I mean, you know, I've seen it done every, every way and I think there are just different situations call for different ways of handling it. You know, so sometimes I will say, I will recommend, go ahead and initiate benefits. We'll complete the investigation. Sometimes I'll say, no, do not pay anything yet. You know, let me finish the investigation. So I know that's, can kind of sound confusing, but the, the big point, the broad point is you are not um, kind of hemming yourself in if you initiate benefits, indemnity or medical. That claim can still be denied, okay? Um, so just keep, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. And, excuse me? There's really no not really. deadline on that. I mean, I would say in practice, you know, in my experience, you're going to, it won't be that long because if you decide that, well, this needs to be denied because you're doing your investigation as that initial treatment's being done. But for example, sometimes it might be some catastrophic in injury where maybe the, you know, it's a, a super serious injury where you're, you're thinking, well, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's try to go ahead and um, let him have the brain surgery or whatever, you know, if it's some catastrophic injury. Um, but there are times where you feel very strongly initially that this is not compensable and, you know, we'll say, well, he needs to put that on his, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, um, but I think the broader point is they're all kind of like I was saying, they're all these different, depends on the, the facts of the situation, but the broad point is you're not limiting yourself by initiating the benefits. You can still, that claim can be denied. And that's happened where some, uh, you know, Dana may have gotten a claim or somebody gets a claim in and, you know, they're paying benefits and then something comes up that we didn't know about. And then she says, hold on a second. I just talked to the employer. They said this, it raises a defense. Can you look at that? So then I look at it and say, yeah, it's, it, I don't think this is compensable. We have these two defenses to that claim. And then you, you can deny it. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Cause I think we talk about jumpsuits and all that later. Yep. So, um, okay. okay, well, why don't we, we've been going for about an hour. So why don't we take a, 10 minute break or 10, 15, 15, 15 yeah. or 15 minutes.
see you. Hey, Henry, good to see I'm you, a, man. I'm a Congra I mean, uh, congrats on your retirement and, um, you know, golly. It's I'm, different. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really different. Um, but anyway, I hope, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear that you enter the next ombudsman, yeah, so it'd be great yeah, to work with yeah. you. Um, uh, I think they've, they've even have approval to add additional. I mean, ombudsman. it's the best program the state probably runs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. and, and, and um, uh, Ted's retiring. I yeah. mean, you know. I think he got wind that he, that he needed to be there 10 years before he could get Alabama well, to retire. He was going to retire, and then he and decided then, he yeah, was going to, because yeah. then they, um, oh gosh, I'm going blank. Um, they just hired uh, Devonna Johnson. Yeah, Devonna. Yeah, and I, um, Segrist. Yeah, Segrist, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Devonna Segrist. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, but yeah. Um, but anyway, she, and she's been great to work with too. Okay, but anyway, yeah. I think she was supposed to take his spot, and Ted's like, I'll stay a little bit longer to get that retirement. So anyway, well, it's great to see you. It's good. Nice to to see always you good too. to see you. I'm and gonna uh, take, I'm going to take this book with me. Yeah, today. absolutely. One of the pages. Absolutely. Well. Well, congratulations, Thanks, and sir. hopefully I'll see you around. So you work with Cindy Bank. Hey, John, John Webb. Yeah. John Miller. Yeah. Question. Um, sure. I come from PNC world. Okay. De decades over there. Okay. So in the situation you were talking about where you direct someone to care even though you might not cover the loss, mm -hmm. are you doing that under an ROR or anything like no, that? No, there's no, there's, well, no. Mm -mm. No. It really isn't. I mean, you don't have, I mean, so I, it's really not a coverage you know, that reservation of rights would be for whether there's coverage under the policy. Right. And this is just whether the claim is compensable under the work compact. You know, is it a claim that should be paid under the work compact? So there's no reservation of rights. There's really no, it's a great question coming particularly from that world, but there's no, not even a letter saying, we're going to provide medical treatment, but we're reserving the right not to, right, to, to, you know, pull this back. And I've, it's not required. I've never seen that ever okay. in 20 years of doing this. It, it frankly, now that you raise it, you know, if you knew, it, you know, it wouldn't be anything wrong with doing that, but it, it doesn't have to be done. I've never seen anybody okay. do it. So okay. you're not, but you're not kind of handcuffing yourself to a compensable claim by starting benefits. In fact, right. they, they encourage you to act. They want you to do that. Right. Just give them the For benefit the of the doubt, right. right? You know, right. if somebody okay. needs brain surgery or, you know, they're out of work and they got three kids and whatever, you know, they, they want you to pay those benefits. The, you know, the problem is once you've paid it, it's no getting it back, you right. know. So right. generally I don't recommend that they do that if there's a serious question about it. But you got to balance that also against, you know, we're going to talk about outrage claims where they can, they can sue the adjuster or the, the case nurse or something like that for outrage or the, the work comp carrier for outrage for outrage you know for not providing those benefits and that that can be then tort claims against the people handling the claim right. so you want to obviously avoid that like if you're the adjuster working with me like Dana you know I'm trying to avoid getting you in that situation because I don't want you to get sued for outrage and your your comp carrier doesn't want you to get sued for outrage and uh, where there can be tort liability and things like that and they're basically saying look you know they um, you know, they were just trying to, they did this, you know, spitefully and didn't want them to get the benefits and they're trying to harm him or force right, him into right, a settlement or right. things like that. Right. So okay. that's kind of, so right. yeah, but that's a good question. Right. Appreciate yeah, sure.
All right, we'll probably go ahead and get started. Um, there may be still some few people out, but they'll trickle back in. Um, so I just kind of want to keep up with it. And we might bypass some things um, and go through here. And like I encourage y'all, especially if you're new, um, you know, feel free to come back and read some of these because um, we don't. We want to try to focus on some of the real Alabama specifics that I know everybody's here to hear. So. Um, what if a claimant refuses to cooperate with medical treatment? Yep, okay. I'll let John take that because um, that's code. So, if you're if you're paying, well, if if you're paying temporary benefits, if you're paying TTD, and a claimant refuses to cooperate with medical treatment, then you can terminate those benefits, which is a very big motivator. To get to the doctor. Yeah. Those checks stop coming. <laughs> so it, it's a valuable tool we can use. Um, I would say most of the time, if somebody's like missed a physical therapy appointment or even Once. two, yeah. <laughs> well, Dana may have just like, <laughs> Dana's like, nope, we're cutting it off. Um, Depends on who they are. You, usually if they've missed, a, you know, one or two physical therapy appointments, and generally they're going to have some excuse, the car didn't work or, you know, sick or something. You know, I don't advise you try to do this every time because then you look like to the yeah. judge that you're just being overly aggressive um, but it's a great tool to know about and when the appropriate time comes to use that tool yeah. um, you know if they're not going to their authorized um, orthopedic appointment or some treatment that's really important or valuable and and generally you'll see a pattern I mean you'll know I mean and then you'll say okay we need to kind of rein this person in they're just not cooperating with the treatment but it doesn't mean necessarily if they miss one appointment, then you just call me and say, hey, we need to cut off benefits. Um, you, you'll know when. And um, I had another thought. If they have problems getting to their appointments, do be reasonable. Um, I would rather them continue treatment than deal with a broke day, you know, and, and move things along. Um, by providing them transportation than to have a claim remain stagnant because they got a broke down car. So. And that's something in Alabama that you may or may not know. I mean, so in Alabama, you, you do not have to provide them transportation. You know, under required. the act, it's not required. But I always recommend that you do that if they need transportation. If the car's broken down or if for some reason they can't get a ride, and I mean, just stuff like that happens. Um, I recommend you pay for the treatment because you you got to pay for you're paying mileage anyway. And again, I guess back up. Some people may not know that, but you know if you you pay for mileage that when they're traveling to and from their doctor's appointments, and so you're going to have to pay that anyway. The transportation is more expensive. There's no question about it. But if they if they have a legitimate reason that they can't get there. I mean, like exactly what Dana said, you want them to be there so they are getting better. They're getting the treatment, they're getting better, they're getting to maximum medical improvement and they're getting back to work and you're closing that claim. I mean, so it's, it doesn't really help us to, you know, not provide them transportation because then they're just sitting at home and they're getting angry and they're, getting, they're not getting well and it's just, you know, it's just a kind of a spiraling downward type situation that it usually doesn't end well. So. That's a good point, and I, I, I highly recommend that you do it. Although, and I have a lot of people, or not a lot, but some some clients will, will call and just say, well, I don't have to do this, do it. And I'm saying, no, you don't have to do it. And I think, you know, sometimes if that person's been a complete thorn in their side, then maybe they don't want to do it. But it, it, it it's short-sighted. You, you need to do it nine times out of ten just because you want them to be getting that getting that treatment and getting well and that's just, the whole yeah goal, right just remember you know I mean the law is already against you because the the law says that it's construed in favor of the injured worker so um, just just think with everything that you do and I think this goes for no matter what state you handle claims in everything you do imagine telling what you're gonna do before a judge and if you do that you'll probably Where did you hear that from I don't know could have been a good lawyer one day. <laughs> um, but if you do that, then, you know, I, I think you'll, you'll be on, on the best side of, of things um, to consider what is fair and reasonable. So. Now, are you required to automatically pay mileage reimbursement, or is that a benefit that has to be discussed between the injured worker? 
it does have to be requested. That actually is the next slide. And they, they well, they, they yeah. sub, they'll submit no, the mileage, okay. you know, on a form. You know, sometimes carriers will have forms where they might write it on a, you know, piece of notebook paper and send it to me or something like that. Um, so, but that is something that has to be requested. And golly, you're gonna, and I don't know why I'm stumping myself on this. Dana probably knows, but there, I think there is some, because I've had this come up where they don't submit it within a year? One year from the date of okay, service. I knew you would know that. Um, then I don't think you have to pay it. And I think at least, kind of to her point, I think it's reasonable if somebody doesn't turn it in for a year to say, well, we're not going to pay that. I mean, you've, you've waited a year to turn that in. Your claim's mm -hmm. been closed and whatever. So right. um, one, one point I was going to make in, in terms of refusing to cooperate with medical treatment, it, it's kind of similar to this, and it's, Again, it's just kind of another tool. It's a little bit of a creative one, I would say, but um, I've seen it help. It doesn't work every single time, but it can help. Um, you, you have a claimant that is um, going to these clinics and he's getting pain medication. Say he's, he's, on, uh, he's with a pain management doctor, which of course we're trying to avoid if we can, but some claims in, in there. Um, and they're testing positive for other drugs, or they're not, t let's say they're on Lortab, and they go get drug tested, and there's no Lortab in their system, but there's marijuana or cocaine or something like that in their system. So they're selling the Lortab, and they're doing illegal drugs. And we're paying for them to go to this pain management. So it, it's a frustrating situation when it happens. It doesn't happen all the time, but again, just kind of giving you some just kind of being aware of things and tools that we can use. Um, what I've done in those cases, and again, it wouldn't be maybe the first time that that happened, but if it happens again, um, what I've done is filed a kind of a motion with the court requesting that we be relieved of having to provide the medical treatment because they're not cooperating with medical treatment. It's really not set out in this code section to do this, frankly. Um, it's again it's being kind of creative it's pushing the envelope a little bit but we'll ask the court we'll just lay that facts out and generally judges don't like people that are not taking their pain medications and they're using other illegal drugs and so that usually can and again you know I might file this motion saying look judge you know laying all this out he's he's not testing for the drugs he's supposed to be test taking he's taking these other illegal drugs the pain management doctor has now kicked him out of the clinic, and so now I'm looking for another pain management doctor. And then maybe that happens once, and maybe we find another pain management doctor, and then it happens again. And generally that's when I'm like, okay, we're going to file a motion, and we're going to ask the court to tell us that make, there's an order saying we don't have to provide any more pain management because he's not cooperating with the treatment. Again, there's not, this code section doesn't really say you can do that, but I mean, if you get an order from the judge saying it, then you can stop doing pain for the medical treatment. What I find most of the times, a judge won't cut that off initially um, because again, there's nothing in the code that says he has to do that. But when you go back again and have to file another motion, they remember, okay, this is the guy that's, you know, selling his lore tab and, you know, he's still doing cocaine or marijuana or whatever it is. And, um, it gets their attention. Um, yes? Well, what if the judge says, well, he obviously has a drug problem. I think he should probably do some, some kind of you know, rehab. Yeah, I've never, never had that happen. There would be no, no um, there's no case law or anything in the Alabama Co the Work Comp Act that would require us to pay for that. Um, so we'd probably have to appeal that one if that happened. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so we would, we would, but it, there's no basis for that in the law that we would be responsible for that. I mean, I've never had anybody even ask to do that. But have, have it's you? a good question. Uh, I've had it before. Uh, okay. Did you pay for it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Really? Yeah.
they not use the system then? So what do I do? Do I send it back to the doctor to do more? Does they just not do like prescription opioid drugs or don't do any prescriptions? Yeah. I do the prescription. Is this an Alabama claim? I don't know. I have so many different states. Okay. Um, and in a situation I, like that, what would I do? Do I send it back to get the lady to do more on her? Because she can't keep trying it if she. If he, if the first one kicked her out, um, you know, I mean, we, if, if, if people aren't compliant with the pain management program, a lot of times versus kicking them out, a lot of the ones in Alabama are just saying, you can stay here, I'm just not giving you pain meds anymore. Um, you know, or. If, if, if they're done, if that's the authorized treating physician and that authorized treating physician just says, I'm not giving you pain meds and that's what they want, but I'll give you a block, I'll do this, I'll do this, yeah, you're or done. I'll give you some non, <laughs> non- I mean, like I would say you're done. Opioid to control your pain. Right. You know, they can do their other medications that maybe it's just not the one that they wanted or maybe even it might not be the one that the doctor initially thought would be best, but if they're not cooperating with, with their pain management protocols, then they may, the doctor, the pain management doctor may decide, okay, well, we're not gonna provide you any opiates. We're gonna do Neurotin or these other potential mm-hmm. drugs that can control your pain or help control your pain. We'll look at some other avenues to do that. And that's the best case scenario, what Dana's saying, is that, and we, we try to, you know, we, we don't want that pain management doctor to kick them out, but a lot of times they have a policy that if you you know, your, your drug test comes back and you're not positive what you're supposed to be prescribing, then they just automatically will kick you out of the clinic. But if they, the best case scenario is that authorized doctor keeps them in the clinic and just uses other modalities, you know, and doesn't kick them out of the clinic. Well, he wasn't going to kick her out the first time. He wanted to put her in methadone, mm-hmm. which is lower, and he went. So I'm not really sure what that plan is. But I, if I was a veteran man, I just would have said, let's send back the kids. Well, probably, I would probably have a nurse like like a MMPI done on her because she probably has an addiction problem that needs to be addressed and shouldn't be on any type of controlled substance anyway. Does that answer your question? Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, so yeah. she uh, she wasn't sure if it was Alabama, but um, a doctor she the claimant wanted to change doctors because she wasn't um, happy with the treating doctor and the and the medicine that she was he was prescribing for. Her. Um, because he was changing her pain meds around um, and so but the the doctor that she's gone to now does not want to give her any type of prescription opioids and she was just curious if you know we would have to provide her with another doctor when it comes to Alabama law the way I would word that or, or say is that it's not about the treatment or the medication it's more about the doctor um, if this is the treating doctor then whatever treatment that doctor recommends is what we would be obliged to do. Um, but we're not, we can't, you know, in Alabama, we don't just bounce around, you know, doctors. You have your treating physician, um, which would ultimately, I think, kind of go into the next, you yeah, know, one of the about, next slides yeah. about the panel, but, um, and how to burn that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, in, doc, in, in Alabama, it's more about the authorized treating physician than it is about the treatment. And for example, in this situation, um, the doctor wanted to put them on methadone and the claimant didn't want that. But in Alabama, it'd just be tough luck. I mean, you're, you either the take the take. treatment they're recommending or you <laughs> yeah. just don't go to the doctor. So, yeah. um, which is, you know, that's pretty easy on our end. You know, they, they don't want to do it and then they just don't go. And, yeah. you know, they, they do something else. But so. they don't get another doctor. Right. Um, uh, I've got one actually in Tennessee right now. He's been on pain meds for a while for an injury, and, and we were going to do an MSA. MSA, you know, costs fifty-four thousand dollars, and we're going to look to settle it. But he realized obviously that money was going to go to an annuity. It was going to be a deposit, you know, all this kind of stuff. And he just wanted the money in his pocket. And I told him, and I don't know if anybody's ever done this. And I said, well, you know, I said, if I tell you what, I said. Um, if you come off your medicine and stop going to the doctor, if you don't really feel like you need it, then you can probably pocket a lot of that. And he said, well, you know, well, I don't, you know, he said, I don't need it. So, I mean, he literally has called me and said, I've told my doctor I don't want the medicine anymore. They're going to, you know, pull me off of it because he wants the money in his pocket. And I said, well, you know, it's not dollar for dollar. I'm not giving you $54,000 in your pocket, you know. And he goes, well, that's fine. So he's coming off everything. So 
you know, a lot of times money speaks. People don't do what, you know, or don't even take it or don't, they know they don't need to take it. They're just taking it for the sake of and they'd rather have some money, you know. So um, as long as he understands the law, I mean, maybe hopefully we can get a letter from the doctor and try to get some type of new MSA or, you know, zeroed out MSA or something like that. And as long as he understands everything, signs off on it, then, you know, we're good to go. And we just settled the claim for $25,000 versus a $54,000 MSA because he just said he'd rather come off of it. So, well, okay. Mileage reimbursement, we just talked about that. Um, so we'll skip to panel of four physicians and surgeons. Um, so that's a big thing that, you know, all adjusters deal with on every, you know, m most claims or a lot of claims. So in Alabama, if the, the claimant is not happy with his first doctor, he, can he or she can request a panel of four physicians. It's literally a list four, you list four doctors on the panel, the panel, and um, you provide that to them and or their attorney, and then they make a selection from that. And it's important to note that if it's a, they're, let's say they've they've been to kind of what I call the the you know kind of gatekeeper doctor, the initial doctor, um, and then they've been referred to an orthopedic doctor. So they're not happy with the orthopedic doctor, and they ask for a panel of four. Then you have to provide you know four orthopedic doctors, and it has to be four orthopedic doctors that are that do whatever type of you know if it's a back or a shoulder you know obviously the orthopedics a lot of them are very specialized on what they do so obviously i mean it goes without saying you got to provide them one that does that type of work um, one thing that is becoming increasingly difficult that i see dana probably gonna, it is they can't be in the same practice and that is as these orthopedic clinics particularly are um, uh, consolidating into these big gigantic clinics, it makes it a lot harder to do that. So that's a problem. Dana may want to talk more about that, but I, that's that's a big problem. That I thought. Wait, was there something though that happened that said that it kind of was allowed? Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it, it's you. I could be mixing from. Stuff. You're not. You're not allowed to provide them from the same clinic. Now, <coughs> I've had situations where, and not necessarily with orthos, because there are a lot more of those. But let's say it's a. Uh, maybe a neurologist or something that it's not as many of those and there's a few clinics. I've just talked to the other side and said, look, we can't find any. I'm going to put another one on from this clinic. And generally they're okay with that. But mm -hmm. technically you're not supposed to do it. So that's, yeah. that's something just to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so long as further treatment is required. All right, that's I get when that full duty release comes, oh, I want to see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the question was, that's and this a is question. a very good question. Um, used to deal with this a lot, not quite as much now, but, but still do. So the question was, you know, the, the act requires, and it's up on the screen, uh, let's see where it says, I mean, you know, what it says, um, if the employer is dissatisfied with initial treating physician selected by the employer and quote, if further treatment is required. So her question was, okay, the persons at MMI, they've been released by the doctor, is further treatment required? And that's a, it's a great question. Um, and you can take that position. So kind of like when Dana was telling the claimant that they were lying in my early years, I challenged this a lot, okay? And, and what ends up happening is the, the plaintiff attorney will file a motion saying they're not, we've asked for a panel of four, we're not happy with the first doctor, and we feel like we need more treatment. My back's still hurting. Although the doctor said they don't need more treatment. And then they bring their client up to the stand mm -hmm. and cl client and they, you know, have a song and dance and they're on a walker and their backs, they're bent over and the judge every single time has said, provide them the panel of four. Yep. So You'll just lose I it. used to challenge that <laughs> a lot. And, and we, sometimes maybe it would work, but generally speaking, they would they would push back, they would file a motion. I'm spending my client's money, and I'm not really getting the result that we wanted, right? So just kind of like Dana got, you know, learned something on the recorded interviews. I kind of learned something on that. You know, I was super aggressive on that at first, and and I'm not saying that there's not a situation where you couldn't do that. 
but just most Pick of the time, choose, I don't yeah. think it's going to work that way. Um, but there are some situations maybe where if the doctor has said something specific about, you know, there, you don't need any more treatment or particularly with something. Not related. That, right. Something like that. You could push back on that. I think so, and yeah. just kind of how strong just, they are. Just the feel that you also get of the claim and where it's going to go. Um, maybe also the doctors in your area. If I know that I'm in this particular area and I got four really great doctors to put on that panel, um, and I know what that MRI says, and it says that it's absolutely normal, go ahead and burn it. Why not? You know, um, I mean, and then that way you're completely done. Just, you know, do what you can to try to move the claim to a close versus trying to keep, you know, that's me personally speaking, but um, I think it's just a matter of knowing your doctors, knowing your injured worker and where you're, and the injury and where you think it's gonna go. But I mean, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have to provide that panel and I, if I, it goes I, legal. Yeah, and I- It's just not worth the fight. I, I, I fought that a lot because my position was the doctor is saying there's nothing treat, no treatment necessary, but you know, the claimant is saying, I know he says that, but my back still hurts, my shoulder still hurts, my neck still hurts, I can't do this, I can't do that. So, um, you know, and the judge can base it off of what the claimant's saying. So, um, so that's the, you know, generally what you deal with, you get one panel, except the exception is you can get a, a second panel if it's a surgical panel. Mm -hmm. So let's say from our example, um, he's been to one orthopedic doctor, didn't like Dr. Jones asked for a panel. We give him a list of four other orthopedic doctors. Um, he selects Dr. Smith from the panel. He goes to Dr. Smith, and Dr. Smith is saying, well, Dr. Jones said you don't need surgery, but I think you do need surgery. If surgery is recommended, you can ask another panel. So you're kind of getting another opinion on the surgery. That's the only situation where you can get another panel, is a surgical panel. Surgery has to have been recommended by the authorized treating physician. Um, and um, Otherwise, there's no second panel. Uh, you know, if, they, if, if Dr. Smith did not recommend surgery and the claimant says, well, I don't like Dr. Smith either, well, there's no additional doctor. Dr. Smith is your authorized treating physician for the life of your claim. Um, and that kind of maybe segues a little bit into the last point I think on the slide is that, you know, I, I recommend you put that in writing, you know, confirm it in writing to the claimant or their attorney that, you know, this is who you've, we provided you the panel, this is who you've selected, um, just to make sure there's no confusion about that. Um, because in reality, you know, these things can kind of drag on because they pick Dr. Smith from the panel. Dr. Smith, we send him all the medical records and they get maybe a case nurse involved to say, hey, we need you to see this patient. And he looks at everything and says, well, hmm, Dr. Dr. Jones said that there's nothing else that can be done and this is non-surgical. I don't want to see this patient. Mm -hmm. So then we've got to go put another doctor on the panel. And that's what can get really, I mean, Dana deals with this more than I do, but it can really get hard particularly in something where there's a, uh, a um, you know, somebody that's not, a, there are not as many neuro, neurologists or, you know, maybe a psychologist or something like that, that there are really not as many out there to choose from that do workers comp. So that can make it very, very difficult. Um, and or I you have you, a completely normal MRI and a doctor's like, why would I want to see that, you know, or something like that. But um, me personally, I mean, especially if it's an iffy situation, um, a lot of times, you know, especially if I've got a nurse on there, I'll try to reach out to the doctors, you know, ahead of time um, to see if it's something that they, so I don't have to keep doing that replace game. Um, and also, I mean, and, and it's just funny because he said a, a particular name, but um, just me personally, and I know a lot of people disagree with, may disagree with this, but you know, put doctors on there that are just, that are going to be ethical and do right and not do you, I guess, a favor. Because if, especially if you've got a claim that's in litigation, um, you know, or, or legal or anything like that. I mean, it, it's just going to be a challenge if you have a doctor, you know, on there and they end up, I mean, 
you know, these lawyers are, are getting wind of these, some of these doctors and some of these names. And so just, just put someone on there, you know, that you know has a good reputation. Um, it's just only going to do you well in the long run. Do everything you can to make yourself look like the good guy, not the bad guy who's trying to, you know, sneak one by. So, um, Timing for payment yeah. of medical bills, and Dana, this is probably you, and I think, didn't we talk about 12 months? Yeah, uh, so the last, the last little part, just talk about the one year um, from data service for reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses or mileage. That's an Alabama rule. Um, work Comp Act does say that um, all medical bills should be paid within 25 working days of receipt of the claim. They can't assess a 10% penalty. Uh, I, I've never been assessed. I don't know if anybody has. Um, so, in a, in, but, you know, try to, try to do what you can, um, do it right. Um, and then, obviously, there's time, you know, there can be a timely filing rule, too, with, you know, like just similar to Medicare, where they have one year from the date of service to get you the bill. But you are, they are supposed to have had notice that, where the bill was supposed to go. So there can be some disputes there because people want to deny for timely filing, but these people will come back and go, I never knew anything about you, or I, I did send it, but it got lost, you know, so just keep that in mind. Um, and I think that's kind of really it on that. And so you are, you are, I, I know a lot of companies that are, that shit is their standard process to you are everything. Um, no matter what state you're in, you, you are it. So, I mean, this will kind of cover this from an Alabama standpoint. It's a lot of money down the drain to me. Just out of curiosity, <laughs> if, if, does any, raise your hand if you have used or familiar with utilization review in Alabama. Or, or, or in anywhere, Alabama. anywhere. Okay. How about in Alabama? Okay, nobody. Um, okay. Um, it, you know. Utilization review is a tool that you can use in Alabama. Um, and, and I'm kind of like Dana. I mean, I, I think you pick your battles with this. I mean, I, I do have seen some carriers where, you know, they're, they're sending a, you know, a guy that has a, you know, our authorized doctors read the MRI, neg <laughs> you know, positive for a herniation at two different levels and is recommended diffusion. And it's a doctor we've been using for 10, 15 years. A very blatant and, accident. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the accident's, it's compensable claim. And they're sending that to utilization review. I'm like, it's just a waste of money. I mean, why would we question that, you know? Um, so, I, you know, I think there are places for it to be used. Um, I think it's more used sparingly. Um, you know, typically when I... You know, Dana may have, she's got probably more experience with this in terms of things like that, you know, you are in things like that. But for me, typically it will come up when, um, you know, there's some big procedure that, um, you know, the carrier is questioning whether it should be related or not to the accident, whether this is something that should be paid. And again, in my younger years, I um, was more aggressive with this and quickly learned that um, 10 times out of 10, it was a waste of money. Um, not nine out of 10, every single time, because what would happen would be, you would get a, get a procedure, you would send it off for utilization review, and again, if y'all haven't done it, some of y'all have a little bit of experience with it, but the way it would work is, we would send it off to a utilization review doctor that would review all the medical records and determine whether this should be was connected and should is a reasonable treatment that we should be paying for. Um, the utilization review doctor has never seen the patient. They were lived in Pennsylvania, Texas, or someplace. Um, had well, only reviewed the medical not records. Not the same specialty. Right. <laughs> you know, they sometimes totally they weren't specialty. an orthopedic surgeon or something. So. They would review everything and say, no, we don't think this is reasonable for y'all to pay for it. So plan of attorney files a motion. We go up in front of the judge, and it usually would go something like this. They would have their client there who was on a walker, you know, couldn't walk, needed surgery. And the judge would ask me, well, well John, um, the original recommended treatment came from your authorized doctor, right, that you sent them to. Yes, sir, that's correct. It's our authorized doctor. But you didn't like that opinion, so you've gotten another doctor to look at it. Well, yes, sir. 
And um, so now the doctor that you are relying on now has never seen Mr. Smith. Is that right? Yeah. He lives in Texas, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. And um, so Dr. Smith now says that this surgery isn't necessary and he's never even seen the patient. Right. Denied. No, you're going to give him the treatment. So it, 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 and I'm being a little bit kind of trying to make a point, um, but that's generally how it goes. And again, there are times where I have used it for certain things that has been, it's been successful, but most of the time it's not. And I think you have to really be selective about what you're trying to you are. It could be some, for example, some procedure that is unusual. Um, I remember I had one where there was this, like an IDET procedure that I'd really never heard of where they, you know, inject cement into the, into the, um, into the disc space. I'd never heard of it, um, had not ever seen it used in kind of these types of, you know, situations where somebody had a, a, a back problem. Um, and so, you know, you kind of, you are that because you're not really sure if that's something, it's just not something I'm familiar with and I'd been doing, you know, practicing for 15 years and never heard of it. So something like that, that just kind of catches you off guard. You know, obviously also one of the byproducts of that is your authorized doctor that maybe you've been using forever is now mad at you because you're questioning what he's recommending. Mm -hmm. And typically in my experience, when I have done UR, it's somehow we've ended up with some doctor that we're not as familiar with. Um, and that can happen for various reasons. It's kind of unusual, but it kind of, it can happen for various reasons. So that's kind of my take on UR. I think you just need to be very selective on what you challenge. Um, and I yeah. think you kind of feel the same way. And maybe yeah. that's way too much about UR, I don't know. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously there's a big case, you know, that Auburn versus Brown. I mean, a lot of people cite that, I guess, when it comes to that. So if you ultimately end up denying medical treatment from an authorized treating doctor, you know, I mean, doctors want to, or plaintiff attorneys want to put you at risk for, you know, some type of bad faith, and we don't have to go into all of that right now, but that's sometimes where you are can get you, if you're trying to deny medical treatment, again, if you've got something outlandish that's just not reasonable, um, and you really feel like you want to do a UR, my recommendation would be to, you know, use the right type of UR companies that are familiar with Alabama, um, and I would probably go with something more like a peer-to-peer. Um, that way you're actually having a doctor who's like-minded, who's in the state of Alabama, you know, who's, and, and who's going to have a reputation with the judge or, you know, or judges are going to be familiar with, with them and their work and it's not going to be some guy from California and they're going to be like, what are you doing? Um, those I, I feel are more successful. Um, I've even, I was surprised to hear, I don't know, it was the last year, year before last, there was actually um, a judge here from Mobile and he was actually asked um, his thoughts on UR and if he would actually consider it. And, and surprisingly, he said he would, and, and I, but I do think that that was kind of part of that for him was, you know, making sure that it is somebody he, you know, he can more relate to versus, you know, somebody who's way off, off the beaten path. So um, that would just be my, my thought on that. But again, I know a lot of companies, um, uh, M, not MFED or one of them, I guess, I think they have to literally use UR for everything, but that's just their requirement, so for no matter what you do. So. Post-accident drug screens is the next topic. Um, so in Alabama, you know, there's a defense to, compensa to, to compensation um, if you are positive for, you know, test positive for drugs. So if you're impaired from drugs or alcohol, um, there's a defense under in Alabama, um, you know, to compensation. So, um, in Alabama, if you if if somebody gets injured and they go to the hospital and they're given a Department of Transportation a DOT test, drug test or compatible DOT test, you are and you're you're positive for an illegal drug you're presumed, for purposes of Alabama law, to be impaired, okay, uh, when that action happened. There's a presumption, presumption of impairment. I also have to prove not only that they were impaired at the time of the accident, but I have to prove that the impairment caused the accident. So it's kind of a two-part test 
a lot of people think, oh, well, you got a positive drug test. This is not a compensable claim, and it's not that easy. And, and frankly, it's, it's, there's a lot, there are a lot of moving parts to these uh, drug impairment defenses. Um, I'll give you an example. So but the easiest example, I think, is the guy that's walking through the plant, and he's high on cocaine, um, and something drops from the rafter up above him and hits him in the head and knocks him out. Well, his impairment had nothing to do with that accident. So that's a compensable claim. Another example is um, you've got two coworkers driving. The, um, the passenger is high on cocaine. There's an accident. The, the accident happened. Well, the passenger in the passenger seat gets injured. His impairment had nothing to do with why that accident happened. So there's no causation. So it's just important to keep in mind that you have to prove not only impairment, but you also have to prove causation. And that can be tricky depending on what the circumstances are. I mean, I, I see a lot of these cases. Um, and also, you can prove this defense without a DOT test. You can still prove impairment without a DOT test. In Alabama, it's just that you don't, you're presumed to be impaired. So you really kind of got that prong done if it's a DOT test. If it's not a DOT or DOT compatible test, then I've, all, I've got to prove impairment. And I've got to come up with evidence that will show that this person was impaired. Part of the evidence may be a, a drug screen that's not DOT compatible. Okay, so I can still use that drug test, but I also have to be able to show a proper chain of custody. So I have to be able to show the chain of custody from when the blood was drawn or the urine sample, you know, the blood was drawn, then they take it to the lab and they sign off that this person delivered it to the lab unadulterated. So there's a chain of custody that I have to also be able to prove um, to be able to establish it using that drug test. Um, so we got a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we see that. I, I, there are outside parties. If you're notified timely enough, um, there are outside parties that you can get to go in and do them. UAB will not do a drug screen, um, so you do have to utilize an outside party to try to go in and, and make the collection. Um, and usually they will, you know, make sure you have the MRO um, and, and make sure there is an MRO. That's very important on a positive drug screen. I've even called labs before and to, you know to see how long a sample was stored um, and how long they would keep it should you know the claim get contested but um, MRO is a medical, medical review, review officer. officer yeah but just you know it, it is a big thing um, I don't know that I wouldn't you know if you're running into that a lot try to have a company that you can contract with that you can call and and have someone go in and do that some employers it may be the people who do their um, uh, pre-employment physicals or, or something like that um, or if they're just seen in the ER, ER initially you know maybe that same day try to send them over to a clinic you know to go and have it done or something but um, I know Master Check I'm not sure if anybody's even familiar with them they're a surveillance company out of Tennessee they do a lot of different stuff and they they have a lot of contracts with, um, I don't know if it's Quest Diagnostics or one, some type of company that will go in and do drug screens for you or, or try to collect them for you. Um, and then there are other places that do too. But it, it, is, it is a thing. EDPM was one that I used to use way back when too. I don't know if they're still around, but it's been a while. But no, it, it's a problem. Vanderbilt doesn't do them either. One quick, you know, I. I Go ahead, sorry. Time frame for the drug screen, 24 hours? Well, I mean, it, it really <laughs> needs to drug. be done. I mean, what you're trying to show is, I, I don't know that there is a, to my knowledge, there's no, there's nothing in the code or anything right. that says it has to be done within this time frame. But what you're trying to show is there's no way that they could have ingested the drugs after the accident, you know, so that happens. Um, I've got one right now where he went to the first doctor and he supposedly went back into the room to give the sample and his wife was in there and it came back negative. 
Well, then for some reason they needed to transfer him somewhere else and they did another sample and it was positive. She wasn't there. And, um, and, it, and, and so, but, but, but what happened was, he, he, I think he was admitted to the different, they had transferred him somewhere and they admitted him to the hospital. And so the test was not taken until the following day, but he was in the hospital. So, I mean, unless somebody brought methamphetamine up to the hospital for him, you know, we've got him. Um, and he even, you know, and you'll get crazy stuff. He even admitted in his statement that um, <laughs> he was taking meth to keep up with the production, you know. So um, <laughs> I tried a case, this was a long time ago, but it kind of, it, it kind of goes to the point of, you know, if you don't have a DOT test, you, you're looking for other evidence that you can point to to show that they were impaired. And so it's important to get statements from coworkers, yeah. things like that, that see, okay, did he seem impaired? You know, was he um, acting consistently with the impairing effects of cocaine or was he acting consistently with the impairing effects of marijuana? And I had a case years ago that we ended up trying and I didn't have a DOT test, but I had a, I had a positive drug screen and I was able to get, there was a witness that was his coworker that happened to be an ex-deputy sheriff who had been trained in identifying people, you know, when you pull somebody over, whether they're suffering from some impairment from drugs. And so he, I was able to put him on the stand and he was able to testify about what he observed and even that, you know, he had been served as a deputy sheriff so he kind of knew what to look for and things like that. So we were able to establish impairment through that witness and the drug test, you know, it was just kind of two different pieces of evidence. Um, but um, anyway, so that's just an example of that. It is, I mean, it, pot's harder, obviously, because you have your levels and, you know, when they're at low, lower levels, they're gonna look at a judge and they're gonna say, but I smoked 28 days ago, judge, or I was around somebody that was smoking. And if I'm being honest, I don't know that we all couldn't test positive now, because if you're like me, you walk on the, you know, you walk everywhere and I smell it everywhere. I can drive on the interstate and I'm smelling it. You know, I mean, I've had the, I ate CBD gummies and the, you know, or I ate a cookie that was in my, pa I've actually had one that said I ate a cookie in my work passenger truck and the guy before me must have made pot cookies. Um, so, I mean, I've heard every excuse when it comes to that in the sun. Um, obviously in, in Alabama, you cannot deny medical for a positive drug screen. You can only deny indemnity. Um, and that, and that's, that's a big not, deal. And so. that's not, sorry, but that's not, obvious um, but but it's important to note that they were still entitled to medical benefits and in that case that I tried then we won the trial um, they didn't realize the other lawyer didn't realize they never asked for medical treatment and he could have had his medical treatment I mean because even we just were able to d deny indemnity benefits so it's a that's a very I should have mentioned that and thank you for mentioning it but it's it's not I don't think intuitive to think, okay, well, they can still get their medical treatment, but they can still get their medical treatment. Yes? So if somebody's high on cocaine and they do the drug test and they get reactive, does that mean they're two years old? It's definitely the proximate cause of the accident. You cannot deny medical. That's correct. Yeah, and I've actually had someone stick their hand in a conveyor belt, lose their arm, and yes, and he had, yeah. You're still entitled to medical benefits, lifetime. Medical we had a, we had, and I don't think it was you too. I don't know if it was uh, Candace had. Well, we had some, me. we had someone who took some kind of. It's like something you can buy over the counter at these little gas stations, mm -hmm. and he took a whole bunch of pills and was in like a car accident. And I, I want to say it that was. you had it. I can't remember what the. It's, it's not even like it's an illegal drug. You can buy it. You could because you can buy it over the counter, but it's not an FDA approved you know something but I mean people are crazy now and all the all the stuff that you can find but I think there's a whole seminar this week here on those types of claims you know uh, marijuana claims just because you know now there's CBD gummies Right. Okay. 
you just taught me something. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Um, I know Georgia I would, gives eight hours for all of it, period. They're I would crazy. say that that's really good information, and thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Well, the, the, but the key is you want to make sure that there's no way they could claim that somehow, and I've had them say, oh, well, I, on the way to the doctor, my wife took me and I smoked a joint because I was hurting so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it was after the accident. So I've had that kind of stuff. Of course, that would be within the 36 hours. So it's, it's important for, for me on a legal standpoint, I just want to be able to show that it, it could not have happened after the accident. So. Yeah. And after any ER visit, if they want to, you know, do one there, I would, no matter what, route into the OCMED or urgent care clinic as soon as possible to have them get one done. Um, obviously, if it's positive, you can cross that bridge when you get there as what defense you may have and how that looks in the time frame. So, so statute of limitations in Alabama, the statute of limitations is two years. It's from, the two, it's from two years of the date of the accident. Um, in an acute injury case, or two years from the last date of TTD, temporary total disability benefits being paid. So another way of saying that is the statute of limitations is told until, until the last date of TTD is paid. Does that make sense to everybody? On indemnity. What? On indemnity. Yeah, on indemnity. Yeah. Um, and then um, in a, in a, cumulative trauma kind of um, claim, it's two years from the last date that you're exposed to the hazards of the employment. So if it's, um, you're exposed to some, you know, radon or some chemical or something like that over time, over time, over time, it's the, it's the last date that you were exposed to that at your employment. So it's two days from that date. And, um, you know, again, kind of talking about you can deny indemnity based on, so that's a defense, a statute of limitations defense. So if somebody doesn't uh, file within two years from those dates, then, you know, you would have a defense to the claim. However, there's no statute to medical benefits. So medical benefits are still, would still be, they'd still be entitled to the medical benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, John actually had a claim that we had for car carpal tunnel and uh, with the water authority. Mm -hmm. And um, because, the the no I guess you know I mean you would think the statute would have run but because of the cumulative trauma and the continuous exposure and working it wasn't until she resigned her job probably a year ago um, but she noticed a carpal tunnel four years ago um, the statute hadn't run so you know that that's something to remember and yeah medical's life in Alabama so um, there's no statute there. So uh, notice requirements, so when you have to notify um, the employer of your claim, there's a, there are two different notice statutes in Alabama. The first is a five-day notice statute. Um, I really don't see this come into play a whole lot. Um, even if you don't notify a claimant within five days or your employer within five days, you're still entitled to benefits in Alabama. What you can do is, let's say, um, they didn't notify you for 15 days, you know, a little over two weeks, and they went and sought medical treatment during those 15 days, you would not be responsible for paying that medical treatment. Um, even, you know, so they're saying, well, I, I had to go get it because they wouldn't send me to the doctor. So we're not responsible to pay for that medical treatment while they have not provided us notice. Um, the second um, and more important um, notice statute is a 90-day statute, and that is that one is got some teeth to it. So if you don't report an accident within 90 days, your claim can be barred. You know it wouldn't be compensable. Again, your your medical benefits um, could still be would still be allowed, um, but if but you get to to, to um, deny indemnity benefits. So that's a that's an important. You know it's see it sometimes and again you're looking for things like you know they're going to say oh i did tell somebody but then you're looking for those medical notes where they're going to the doctor and they're never mentioning anything about an accident so that kind of dovetails with my client saying they never told me that they got hurt at work you know um, and then you go and look at the medical records and they they never tell the doctors they get hurt at work so when you get those kinds of things it, it really can help you 
defend the case on that 90 day notice uh, statute requirement. It doesn't have to be written notice. Um, you know, if they're in passing, um, don't say I want to file a claim or anything like that, but just in passing say, yeah, I was, you know, changing that tire, you know, and just kind of felt a twinge in my neck and that was it. That's all they say. And then three weeks later they go, hey, I want to go for treatment. I mean, or, or even three months later, you know, whatever, if, if that supervisor or whatever goes, yeah, I did hear him say that, that's, you know, ultimately you're going to have to hold that and that's, that's going to be considered notice. So the next topic are defenses under section 25551 and um, some of this we've kind of already talked about but you know self-inflicted injuries are not compensable under the act. Um, willful misconduct or horseplay um, situations are not compensable under the act and I would say the most important thing in terms of willful misconduct I think I've got a description, let's see. Um, yeah, so here's, here's kind of a, a, a definition. Willful misconduct includes all conscious or intentional violations of law or prescribed rules of conduct. So the thing that's important in terms of these willful misconduct defenses is it has to be intentional conduct, purposeful. Um, one, one, um, you know, I've had situations where people are required to wear their seatbelt as part of the safety program, right? And so then you, you may have even a, a trucking company where the video, you know, they got an in-cam video that shows that they didn't have their seatbelt on. Well, it depends. This goes back to kind of why those recorded statements are, are real important because you can get some information with the admit things that, you know, I didn't like wearing the seatbelt. You know, I would snap it behind me because I didn't want to wear it or something like that. But nine times out of ten, what are they going to say? I forgot to put it on. It's not intentional. It's just an accident. So, you know, it has to be intentional conduct. They're, they're hard defenses because you've got to, it's, very, it's difficult to prove and establish that somebody did it intentionally, that they didn't just accidentally do it or, or forget or something like that. So. It's a defense, but it, they're, they're, they're kind of tricky and a little bit difficult. Um, injuries involving drugs and alcohol, we, we kind of just talked about that. Um, um, you know, I don't know that I really have anything else to add. We just kind of went through the, the drug test um, impairment defense. Um, willful favor, fa failure to use a safety device. Um, you know, again, it's you know, the key to that is it's got to be willfulness. It's got to be intentional. Um, I was trying to think. Here we go. This is a pretty good quote. I thought this was in here. Um, Thus, to summarize over 75 years of law on the willful misconduct bar, a worker commits willful misconduct involving a violation of an employer's rules or regulations when the worker knows the rule he understands the consequences of disobeying the rule. He deliberately chooses to disobey the rule, and his choice to disobey that rule is unreasonable under the circumstances. So you've kind of got four things that you've got to establish there on that willful fair to use a safety device rule. And, and typically the most, most difficult is that they deliberately disobeyed it. They didn't just forget or were being careless or something like that. So those are, those are pretty, pretty hard defenses, frankly. Um, and now to say on that, I've had, you know, claims where construction worker goes and um, it's really hot summertime in Alabama. It's, you know, 100 and something degree index. It's hot. And, you know, over here there's this um, lake or, or river or whatever, and they go and swing from a rope um, to cool off and, and hop in, herniating a disc in his neck. Well, you know, the question is, is, is that you know, horseplay or, you know, willful violation. Well, the fact is, you know, supervisor said it was okay. So, you know, you kind of lose that. And that's, um, a, that's, I can't remember the name of the case, yeah. but that's a reported case and it was kind of shocking when it came out that, mm -hmm. that that claim ended up being compensable. He's like swing on a, you know, rope swing out on a lake during his lunch break right. and that was a compensable claim. And I mean, I've had firefighters playing basketball. Well, that's part of their, you know, they were supposed to stay fit and fitness and, you know, and one of the biggest ones um, I think I had and, and 
I wish if I would have known, I would have had a video put in here um, because it is the funniest video of all times. And, but it's actually in Tennessee, but it's it been a similar situation here in Alabama where Alpine Coast, like the things in Gatlinburg where you ride down the hill um, on those little scooter things. And so there's big safety training that employees go through um, on how to do that. And this person was the person who actually stood at the top and had to walk through the whole safety spill with everybody who gets on the coaster um, and what to do. And, you know, you have to wear your seatbelt and you have to brake when you know you're doing this and doing that. And so she has to go through everything. Well, it was raining or starting to rain. They, they were shutting down early. And so she had to ride the coaster down the hill and there are cameras all the way down the hill. Like at every angle, there, there's cameras. And so she just, I mean, you know, so we had the video of her and she just quickly hopped in, no seat belt, throws in her purse, on the phone, and so here she goes. And so you see her, and I mean, and she has got speed. And, and so there's this camera angle coming, and she's coming down the hill, and it's at the bottom of the hill. And then there's also one this way, like that's pointing this way. And so, because the curve does like this, and it's really sharp, and she is like flying. And she has on no seat belt, and she's not braking and doing appropriately. And she comes, and when you when you see that corner, like she comes and and it flings her straight off and throws her into a boulder. And I know, it, yeah, you, you already think like I'm, I'm just inhuman to say that it was the funniest video of all time, but it really was. Thankfully, she she wasn't like majorly hurt. She broke an ankle, um, and I think her her tailbone. But she looked like when she was flying, I mean, like her purse and everything went everywhere and it looked like a dummy doll, you know, crashed. I mean, like she was, it's so funny. So, you know, thoughts are world, obviously, with all that training, with all that stuff, you know, we had defense to deny it. And, you know, I mean, she has to tell them what to do every time. I mean, that she's saying the words a hundred times a day for everybody who's getting on that coaster. Well, we denied it, and she went and she had all her medical treatment. We got in litigation on it. You know, ultimately, the outcome was a D&D &D for about $50,000, which still ended up being um, cheaper than what the claim probably would have cost us. But, you, you know, say, so why did she get $50,000? That should be blatant because of one picture that existed in a break room of all the employees riding the coasters without seatbelts because of one picture. <laughs> and so that that's what did it for us. Where was so, that? Was that in Tennessee? <laughs> yes, it was in I Tennessee. But it was, but to be honest, I mean, I say that because uh, it would have been the same in Alabama. Um, you know, had, had there been some, some kind of proof like that, so when you're looking at denying that, facts matter, um, and as much facts and details that you can get from the claimant and that recorded statement and also from your employers, were there signs posted? Were there this posted? You know, it matters because so, it'll be the case or not. Yeah, and so I think the one of the takeaways from that is, you know, if it's a safety rule that's, you know, even a written safety rule, if the employer doesn't enforce it, then, then you're not going to be able to use that for defense. And they can show, oh, well, everybody did whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, kind of, I think, one of the takeaways from that. Um, she had a question, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think of a quick example. Um, let's go back. Was that, to that firefighter in Birmingham who went to his girlfriend's hotel room versus me? Right. Well, and, and I don't know, I think she, I'm trying to think of one more as a horseplay. Yeah. Um, so let me think about this. All right, so I'll give you an example of a case I had. So you're, you're, he had a heart attack. You're at work, right? And so I had this case where it was like a lawn maintenance place. And one crew or one guy 
took the lawnmower that the other guy always used, and it made him mad. You know, like the guy was out of work, and they took his lawnmower and used it for a couple of days, and he came back, and he was like, where's my lawnmower? And so it kind of just started a feud with them about that. And then, I don't know, maybe a couple of days later or, or a week later, the guy came up and approached him and said, you know, I didn't appreciate you taking my lawnmower. And it started a, a, a physical altercation. So once you kind of get into that personal physical altercation, you're deviating from your employment. That's nothing that's benefiting the employer. You're getting outside of that. You're not cutting grass. Now you're getting into a physical argument. Um, that kind of thing can be deemed horseplay. Um, you know, when you're having things like an assault or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think of another example. But you can have deviation from employment without horseplay. Um, you know, for example, um, let's say you are, you're, you're, part of your job is to, uh, you're like a uh, kind of a home health nurse and you're driving from these different, you know, patients that you're seeing and then you decide, you know what, I'm going to go over here to TJ Maxx and I need to get some address or something like that. So clearly you're deviating from your employment and what you're doing is not benefiting the employer. Um, you know, I, I had a case like that where a guy was, wor he, he worked for like a kind of an architectural firm and they were, had architectural plans and he was kind of calling on somebody to go show him a plan and he deviated and went someplace where he wasn't supposed to go. Um, and so th it's things like that as deviation. That's not as much really horseplay. Um, I think the horseplay is more like when you're getting into fights and things like that. That would be more considered the horseplay and you're deviating because you're going outside of your employment and what would benefit your employer. Mm -hmm. and that's considered horseplay. A lot of times, when it comes to fights, obviously you want to focus on who's, who's the aggressor and what was the, what was the fight over. Um, you know, whether the fight was work related or not, um, because someone, you know, left the coffee thing in the coffee pot or, you know, whatever, if there's a fight over that. Um, you know, usually you're not going to cover the claim for the aggressor, um, you know, if they're the one that just walked up to Sally and punched her. You know, I mean, you may cover salaries, injuries, but you're not going to cover, you know, the person who punched her. And the key to the, those cases, and I've got several right now with uh, assaults at work, is um, whether there's an employment-related com component to it. You know, so is this something that was totally personal to them? Um, I've got a case right now where these guys work for the same company, but they were in totally different departments, and they were in different buildings even. And some, something personally had happened outside of work, and as they were getting off, they're out in the parking lot, and the one shoots the other one. He doesn't kill him, but he, he injures him, you know, fairly significantly. Um, but the the animus, the the animosity was, and the fight was brought, or the shooting was fought, brought on from something outside of work, had nothing to do with their employment. Um, so that's a real big key in those in those assault cases. And obviously, the things that we had to pay attention, unfortunately, I have to pay attention to more now because, I mean, frankly, the world is just getting crazier, and people just seem to be um, unhinged, honestly. So whether it's a claimant that may be unhinged or um, anything, it, it, it's a it's a true thing now when it comes to altercations or shootings or anything like that. Um, very sad, but you know. Um, Deviation too comes a lot of times when you know, like John, John talked about, you know, driving is a big thing. Where they were, whether they deviated from their employment, um, people going out of town, um, you know, on a business trip, those can get really tricky because you know if they're on a business trip, most of their activities are going to be covered um, because you're paying for them to do that or, or to be there. So. So misrepresentations, um, this is another potential defense um, under 25551. Um, frankly, I, I really don't see this anymore, particularly after the, um, there's so much more focus on the Americans with Disabilities Act and ADA. It, it restricts you, and I'm not an employment lawyer, I 
we have that in my firm, but I, I know enough about it to, I guess, be dangerous. But, but I don't do that kind of work. But I, I do know enough that, you know, you're not, they don't ask you now in your employment application, you know, about your physical disabilities, okay? So before, you know, if you misrepresented that um, in an application, you could deny the claim if they then, that part of, the, you know, they had a pre-existing condition with their back and they didn't disclose it to you. Um, even back then, 20 years ago, the kind of the, the this, this defense was very difficult because there had to be this specific warning in writing on the application, and I've got it bolded there on the, in the handout. Misrepresentations as to pre-existing physical or mental conditions may void your workers' compensation benefits, and that would have to be in writing in the application that they misrepresented on. Nobody ever had that in there. So frankly, I, don't, I never see that defense. Um, I don't know that it's worth spending a whole lot of time on. Um, Considerations before denying a claim. Dana, maybe this may be you. What do you think? Sure. sure. I don't want to tell them to go hire a work comp lawyer. <laughs> go hire John. Um, no, it, so just discuss any claim with a knowledgeable work comp attorney. You know, before denying it, maybe you have maybe you have a clear slam dunk, um, and you're pretty confident in that. But you know, a lot of times, especially because we, you know we don't have a commission in Alabama law, it's just um, so I feel like it's, I say subjective, but it, it's just can be up to a judge at the end of the day. Um, and whatever a judge wants to do, it's just not, not so cut and dry all the time. So, you know, can discuss with any, sometimes you can run things by them without having to get a formal opinion and they won't charge you for it. <coughs> I don't know if John will or not, I'm, that's not for me to say, but um, decisions regarding convincibility, um, you know, should not unnecessarily be delayed. Uh, again, we talked about, you know, whether you should pay for medical treatment. That's not an admission of compensability. Um, always send a denial letter outlining, we talked about that too, your reason for denial. Um, you know, you didn't meet your burden of proof, not in course and scope, you know, whatever that may be. Um, if you deny a claim, you lose control of the medical treatment. So at that point, you know, if you deny it, they can go wherever they want to go. Again, I strongly encourage on a lot of situations, not every situation depends on the claim. Uh, medical, to deny a claim, you kind of want two grounds. You want medical um, addressed and legal addressed, you know, legal causation. So, you know, it's important to have a good medical backing if you're denying things on that basis, um, like not related, you know, mechanism of injury or, or anything like that. Um, making, um, we've already said that. Those pay, you know, making any payments on a claim does not mean that it is compensable. So, I think um, we maybe let's take a break. So we're we're kind of getting to another section, starting another section, section four, and um, Dana, we might want to. I'm just. We try one. Yeah, we might want to skip or come through some of these and skip so we well, can talk about calculations and and so forth. Well, um, I was kind of. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, but why don't we take a be back? Let's say take another 15 minute break. All right, thank y'all. Yes, it's 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 probably the most you know valuable benefit and the most expensive benefit. So it's it's automatic and it's for life. Um,
I have a hat, but I forgot to bring it. Hey, how are you? Good. It's good to see y'all. Good to see you too. Y'all ready to get the party started? I am. How's it going? It's good. Yeah, I do. I do. I miss my team. I'm Chelsea. I'm in my job. But it had to happen. So, but. Yeah. So, did y'all get all done and transitioned and think everything's wrapped up? I think so. Well, good. I, I closed the project and handed it off to Amanda. And she's well, good. Everybody sounds happy. Well, good. That's good. I'm sure that's a relief for Chelsea. So, I hated to leave her with it, but we were close to done when I left. So She is so sweet. She is sweet. She, she she's is a just, hard worker. Yeah, she is the sweetest person. Yeah. She um. You know, I sent out the project survey, and she she gave she touched me like she gave a really great. Well, she was very. I mean, like she's she's worked with a lot of different companies, and and her experience, and so she was very complimentary of y'all since the very start. She said, I've, "I have a ever worked with a company who's been as on it like them, so which was great." Makes me feel good. Yeah. So y'all and y'all were. So I agree. Huh? Your training. How did it go? It, oh, it, it's going. It's going well. So we've got a little over an hour left. So, um, or, yeah, probably about a little over an hour. So, but yeah. So it looks like we'll probably finish this year. Last year we didn't finish. So I know. I know. I'm Christina Wells. I do too. I miss my team. My job. So, let's catch up later. Yeah, we will. All right, see you later. Warm it up again. <laughs> the bathroom, the water in the sinks in the bathroom is like, it's colder than ice water coming out. Like I'm like, real? No, it's from me. I've got time. I can invite Savannah unless you. I don't know if she's got plans or not. Go ahead and get started so we can 
hopefully try to get as much of this done as we can. And I would say dare f finish early, but <laughs> I don't know if you'll be so lucky. <laughs> um, so what we thought we'd do, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of talk about subrogation and then we're going to, we're going to skip a section, um, which are all the, the calculation sections, which is, you know, I've got examples of every type of benefit that you can pay, and I've got examples of how to calculate that. And I think in a way it's easier just to kind of look at that and try to think through it instead of, it, it's the boring, it's the most boring part. And so we can come back to it if we have time, certainly, but I just think it's a little, the other things are a little more interesting and, um, and the calculations are kind of what they are. It's a little bit hard to kind of a little bit harder to kind of go through that part and keep everybody awake. So, um, so let's let's just talk about a little bit about subrogation. So, um, you know, what is subrogation? Um, does, subrogation um, is, you know, if you have a in, in kind of in the work comp context, it's if if a if a claimant has a claim a separate claim against a third party um, then you can go recover um, some of that money that they get from the third party the, the most the, the easiest way to think about this the example that I see probably the most is um, a situation where there's a you know a work-related car accident okay and so the employee is involved in a work-related car accident and the other car is at fault and so the employee files for work comp benefits, but they also file a auto liability lawsuit against the adverse driver, you know, that wrecked into them and caused the accident. Um, and so the work comp, and again, y'all may know some of this, but work comp is then entitled to get reimbursement or subrogate against that auto liability, the person that was at fault, the, the adverse driver. So they can go back and get money um, from them. Um, and that's kind of the most common example. You know, I'm not going to get into this very much, but there's a formula called the Fitch formula, and it's from the Fitch case. It's a reported case in Alabama that sets out the formula for calculating um, how much money a work comp provider can recover in subrogation. Um, and it doesn't have to be just like an automobile accident. Um, there, there are other, you know, other types of examples of other third party cases, but that's just kind of a common one. And so the Fitch formula basically, in a nutshell, you're gonna reduce the amount, let's say the subrogation lien is $100,000. Well, the Fitch formula is gonna be reduced by the attorney's fee. So let's say he's on a 40% fee, so that's gonna reduce it $40,000. So then you can only recover $60,000 left for recovery for the work comp provider. So that's a very kind of oversimplified example and there's a lot kind of going on with that Fitch formula and I'm not gonna kind of bore you with some of that, but um, I guess I'll just, the next slide, I just kind of told you what a third party was. Um, you know, the most common example is the adverse driver in a work-related auto accident. Um, verify subrogation potential. So. Working with a claimant's attorney on subrogation recovery, so you you want to you want to let the other attorney know that you're involved. Many times they'll already know that you're involved because you've been handling the work comp case as the third party case is going on. But you want to make sure that they know that I'm involved not only to defend the work comp case, but I'm also here to protect the work comp carrier subrogation lien. And so I'm going to typically I would. Let's say, for example, in the, in the example I gave you where the, you've got the work comp claim is maybe count one of the lawsuit and count two of the lawsuit is negligence on an auto liability case. So I'm going to be defending the work comp case until that case is resolved. Typically that would resolve before the, the auto liability case. And then I'm going to continue to monitor that auto liability case to help advise the work comp carrier as to um, kind of the viability of recovery. So is this a really good third party auto liability case or are they pointing fingers at each other and you're not sure who really caused the accident? So it looks like less of a chance to get that suburb recovery back or certainly maybe a lot less than you normally would in a clear liability case. So my job is to kind of monitor that third party case and, and help advise the, the work comp carrier about, you know, 
what are the likelihood of us recovering our, our lean and how much of it? Will we get it all? We might not get it all. We might get less of that. We need to, I need to start making them aware of those types of things as that third party case is going. And then of course, when the, typically in those third party cases, there'll be some type of a mediation and I will generally not attend the mediation, but I'll be available by phone to negotiate that lien at the end of the day. So typically, you know, they'll call me and they're trying to hammer you, wanting you to kind of reduce your lien to help them get the third party case settled. That's typically how it works. Not always, but, but sometimes. So um, that is, let's see. Okay, subrogation waiver is part of settlement. So sometimes, sometimes it might work out where you waive a portion or all of your lien. Um, for example, let's say in a case that um, you know they, they decide at the end of the day they, that you've settled the work comp case, but they left their future medical benefits open. And now you're at the third party mediation and the auto liability case, and they're trying to get that settled. And to get it settled, they say, well, we really need you to waive your $50,000 lien to get it settled, we'll be willing to, the plaintiff saying, we'll be willing to, to close our future medical benefits if you'll waive the $50,000 lien. And of course, that depends on the evaluation of how, how valuable is that future medical benefit. Is the person you know, 20 years old and going to live for another you know, 50 years, or are they 65 and you know, they might live for another 10 years, or whatever the case may be. You know, you need to kind of figure out what is the value of that medical benefit and is it worth the $50,000 that we're giving up. So it's just all part of the negotiation, and, but it's kind of a way that sometimes can be a creative way to use that closure of that subrogation to get a benefit closed out under the act on the medical. Um, let me get behind here. Okay. Um, Go to like 52. Well, I like think we were going to, is this where we're going to, I think we were going to skip. Yeah. Skip ahead. Was it Let me see. MMI 52? Yep. So I think we're going to go to around page 52 where they talk about MMI, maximum medical improvement, return to work. Um, so, yep. I mean, most everybody should know that MMI is maximum medical improvement so just the same as most other states that's where um you know the healing point has process has plateaued their condition cannot be improved or you know say they're as good as they're going to get does it mean that there's no future medical treatment required if they've reached mmi but basically that they've stabilized and that there's nothing medical or major that's going to change your condition um so basically in Alabama, when a claimant reaches MMI, it's a, it's a pretty hard, you know, TTD stops at that point. Obviously, if you're, if, I love it when the doctor says you're MMI, but doesn't do a release status for work and then orders an FCE after the fact because you're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, how can they go back to work, you know, if um, he's not really addressed what they can go back to work doing and re work restrictions? So, you know, bear that in mind. Obviously, if you don't have anything and, and being reasonable and talking with your employer, your client, your insured, whoever, um, as to whether you should, t you know, cease benefits. One of the good things in Alabama is that you can take credit um, when you're calculating, you know, PPD ratings and doing all of that versus other states is that we do get to take credit um, on body as a whole injuries for all TTD paid. Um, so if you've paid, and especially if you've paid anything past that date of MMI, I mean, if, when you get to take it as an offset, you know, it's, it's just not that big of a battle to fight, um, to pay, you know, pay them another few weeks until you get the FCE done or the return to work status officially addressed, stating what they can and cannot do. Um, you can take it as over credit or you can even at MMIs and you know they're going to get a rating, go ahead and switch it to PPD and start paying PPD and take it as a credit off the writing. Um, MMI is a big jumping yeah. off point. I mean, it's just, a, yeah. you know, it's obviously a big part of the claim. And once you reach MMI, you can really, you know, you can start trying to kind of get the claim resolved. It doesn't mean, you know, most of the time, you know, like Dana said, it generally when they reach MMI, 
they're not they're they're pretty much done with that immediate treatment. You know, they're they're every now and then there's still some lingering follow up appointments. Usually not, but sometimes there can be. Um, but usually that MMI, you're going to get an MMI. Uh, we talk PPI might be the next mm -hmm. slide, but um, yeah, return to work. Yeah, you're going to get you know your MMI set. You're going to get an impairment rating of that set, and then you're going to get their restrictions, and you're going to know all that information. And once you know that information, you can start resolving, trying to resolve the claim. You know, and, and sometimes those claims are already with me, and you know we'll start trying to then get the claim resolved with counsel. But it's just a big jumping off point, a big, big kind of milestone in the claim, and it's you can start doing a lot of things once they reach him and reach him in mind, of course. You don't, know. yeah, don't be afraid to ask your doctor for it either. If they're not getting there, if they're not addressing it, send them a letter. You know, what's the worst that can happen? He says, no, he's not there yet. You know, but if he says, yes, he is there because you feel like, you know, hey, we've had 60 visits of PT at this point, and we're, you know, five months post off of a meniscus tear and a surgery, and you know, I mean, what, what, what else is left to do, you know, send the doctor a letter, um, you know, or have your case nurse, you know, ask the doctor if, you know, he'll address it, so. And then usually at the same time, you know, you kind of get the return to work, you know, from the doctor. and It'll be, you know, your return to work full duty or your return to work with these restrictions. Per you, typically at that point, it's going to be the permanent restrictions. Um, and then, you know, of course, from your perspective, and Dana can speak to this better than I can, but, you know, you're, you're kind of working with the employer trying to figure out, okay, well, they can't lift over 10 pounds. Do we have something, you know, within those restrictions that they can do or not, you know? And then it's important for us to figure that out. Are they going to want to come back? And that can be tricky. Sometimes they don't want to come back. But, you know, if you can identify a job within those restrictions, you know, what I recommend if you're not kind of getting – if the – the employer doesn't really want to, I mean, the employee doesn't want to come back and they're kind of not responsive. You know, I've had employers send them a certified letter setting out, you know, we have this job available, it's within your restrictions, and you need to report to work on X day and, you know, verify that you've provided that job for them and then they just refuse to come back. Um, you know, because that can also be a valuable tool later on if, if they kind of, we can show that they did have a, a job within their restrictions that they refused to do. And, and in some cases, not a lot, but, but I did it recently in a case, and I've, I've done it over the years, where you might need to get send a letter to the doctor, the authorized doctor, saying, okay, um, the employer, you've provided restrictions of no lifting over 15 pounds and no squatting, no bending, whatever it is. You know, we've identified these three jobs or these two jobs or this job that's within those restrictions. Will you please confirm, you know, your opinion that the, the employee can perform this job? This is within the restrictions that you've assigned. Yeah. And, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's a valuable thing to have that because then the claimants sometimes are saying, well, I can't do that job. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a, a, a note from the doctor saying, yes, I've reviewed this exact job and you can do the job. And so later, if you're at trial, it's helpful to be able to explain that to the judge that, you know, we've got evidence. It wasn't just like, well, they told me I needed to do this, and I told them I couldn't do that, and it's back and forth and blah, blah, blah. But you've got something in writing setting out the, the exact job duties and what's required of them, and the, the, and the doctor saying, yes, they can do that. So that's something that can be valuable sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and me personally, you know, I'm a big person on therapy. I know a lot of us have TB claims to pay attention to what PT notes say, but they say everything. They'll let you know ahead of time how they're progressing um, and if there's going to be an issue with the return to work. The sooner you can get that job description from the employer, don't wait till the end of the game. Give it, get it sooner. Get it over to your therapist. Let them know what they're trying to get back to doing. Um, you know, the better off you're going to be, especially to me in Alabama, because Alabama is a boat state. Um, and, you know, if they can't go back to work making their same or greater wage, you know, then you're going to have to look at a vocational disability type rating or something like that um, or find something for them to do. But, you know, get that job description, you know, try to try to encourage that return to work. I totally agree with what John said as far as questioning the doctor, having them kind of sign off you know, on that job saying, yes, this is something you can do. Um, 
you know, I've even had um, therapists go out and do a job site assessment before, and, you know, what they gave in the FCE, which would have, you know, released him to a light duty category, and the job was technically classified as a medium category, so he was going to be at, potentially out of a job, but because he went and did a, a job assessment and went out there and actually evaluated it, he actually was able to mark down every little thing that this job was going to make him do, weight limit and everything. He said, actually, he can do this. And he provided a very thorough analysis, you know, of that that's going to be very hard for a judge, you know, to argue with. So there's a lot of different options because obviously not having a job for them to go back to increases your exposure and the value of that claim. And so and the tying into Yeah, Dana mentioned vocation. vocational disability. Look what's the next Look at slide. That. <laughs> um, so kind of segues into vocational disability, um, probably maybe starting with, so in Alabama there's a statute called the return to work statute. And so if the employee goes back to work earning the same or greater wage, then he, is not in, he or she's not entitled to any vocational disability. So you're limited to that permanent partial disability, that impairment rating, you're limited to that. That's a really valuable thing in Alabama is to you know, get them back to work and that really limits what their recovery can be. Um, now you can argue about the, you know, the, how much the impairment rating is, but they're not gonna be entitled to vocational disability if they can return to work at the same or greater wage. Very good tool to use in Alabama. Um, if they can't return to work at the same or greater wage, Dana was kind of covering a lot of this, you know, then they will have an argument they're entitled to vocational disability and that's why it is important sometimes to take that extra step to try to get a little more analysis on the job or to get a doctor to sign off on a job um, because that can help me at trial if, if there's an argument about whether he should be entitled to this vocational disability saying, well, I can't go back and do that work. Um, but that obviously opens up the claim to much more exposure um, to the work comp carrier um, if there's vocational disability, because of course that can go all the way up to permanent and total disability, 100% permanent and total disability. So yeah. um, just a lot more exposure once you kind of open that vocational disability box, um, just a lot more exposure to the carrier. Yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get plenty of attorneys gonna get you a voc evaluator that's gonna say he's a hundred percent totally, you know, and and maybe they say that they're eighty percent, and you're gonna get your voc that's gonna say, you know, that he's twenty five percent based on his education and stuff, and which is again that takes you all the way back to the very beginning of the claim as far as how you handled it in the very beginning. What information did you get? And, and you know, do you know what his education and his skill sets are to apply somewhere else? You know, because if you've got someone who's a high income wage earner, you know, as a as a trucker, and but he's in a light medium duty category because of permanent work restrictions. Well, guess what? You, he has to go and get a voc evaluator. Guess because of that, his skill set may not be. He has a 11th, 10th grade education. And his skill set's not going to be applied to a lot of other places. You know, the likelihood that our people are going to give him 40 percent is probably pretty high, and you're definitely going to have a plaintiff attorney, you know, vote that's going to give him a 90 or a 100, which, you know, should tell anybody that you're going to be settling anywhere between a 40 percent vote and a 90 to 100 percent vote, which is, you know, with a high wage earner can be pretty pretty costly um, and you're going to be looking you know up or close to six figures depending on what the wages are so and a lot of the wage calculations you know are in there but and and personally I typically don't get a vocational expert until toward the very end of the claim to avoid that cost for the carrier I mean there are situations where I do it prior to mediation I mean most and um, because for various reasons, I want to be able to establish that at the mediation, but most of the time, I don't get a vocational expert until mediation has been unsuccessful, and I know, okay, well, we're probably going to go try this case, because at mediation, most of the attorneys that I'm dealing with, just like I know they can go get somebody that's going to say he's 100%, I can go find somebody that's going to say they're not less than 100%, so I, there are exceptions to that. Um, and there are times where I do want to vote at mediation, but most of the time um, I'm not going to get a vocational expert until after the mediation failed and I'm kind of preparing for trial. Um, 
mediations and the ombudsman program. So um, very, very valuable tool in Alabama. Um, you know, the, the ombudsman program has been just wildly successful in Alabama. Raise your hand if you've dealt with the ombudsman program or if you know anything about the ombudsman program. Okay, well, not, not that many. So um, in Alabama, there's a program that's, that's set up through the state of Alabama, the De Alabama Department of Labor Work Comp Section has ombudsman, which is just a mediator. So they're, 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 they're employed by the state of Alabama and they're mediators or ombudsmen that are very familiar with workers' compensation law. And so you can, you can mediate cases with them and resolve cases, and I use them a lot, um, and they're 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 very helpful. It takes a strain off the state court judges. They love the system because a lot of cases resolve through the ombudsman program, mediation program, um, and so you know it just means less cases they have to try because they're getting mediated and resolved through the ombudsman program. But it's a it's a very good program. Um, I've got a handout in here at the back that um, it's, it's, I think it's the only thing in color. It's kind of it's a state of Alabama map, and it just shows the, um, you know, which media, it's got the mediators, it's got their phone numbers, it's got um, what areas of the state that they, um, you know, generally work on. And we've got now one, two, three. 11 mediators throughout the state, and um, this program has really, really grown. And, and, si um, and since COVID, a lot of them are still doing telephonic, so if you just have simple, simple claim that you want to settle and resolve, um, you know, a rating out, um, they will still do things telephonically, um, meet and t discuss with the claimant, go over everything, and then they'll send you the signed paperwork via email, and then you'll go print it out, sign it, scan it back in, send it back, and mail the claimant the check. And it's pretty, pretty simple, one and done, and saves your client insured, you know, um, and our next $1,500. One, and our next line of settlements. So, <laughs> sorry, John. You can do that without paying for it. You can resolve them, yeah. Yep, if you're do, when you're doing simple stuff, you know, PPDs, and I mean, and I've done small med closures too. I mean, you know, they can do that. That's fine. It's legally binding. Um, I think. No, no. I mean, I, Six, I think sixty you, days because we don't have a ten, uh, like a designated work comp commission. I mean, obviously, our judges do have tons of other stuff that they're dealing with, and so if we can keep a lot of that stuff out of their courts, you know, and save your client money. But but this, so kind of the next slide deals with settlements and and in Alabama basically um, they're well hold on a second I'm not sure I didn't really read, but but there's two ways in Alabama to, to settle a case um, one is to go through a state court judge in state court um, and the other is to do it through an ombudsman like we we're just talking about and so when I first started doing this every single case was through the court system I mean it was you go up there and you get a prepare your documents, you, the judge takes testimony, sign the documents, file them in at the courthouse before you left and all that. Um, the, when the ombudsman program came in to play, you know, we used a lot of ombudsmen to resolve cases. They can, they can approve a settlement, it's technically not approving the settlement, but they can sign off on the settlement and it's binding and it's a, it's a binding settlement. Um, after COVID, during COVID, um, the Alabama Office of Courts allowed us to do tele telephonic uh, benefit review conferences. So you could just do them over the phone. You didn't have to even, the ombudsman didn't have to come to my office. We just get on a three-way call. I'm on the call, the plaintiff attorney and his client are on the call, and the ombudsman's on the call. And so after COVID, and it's super convenient, super quick, less expensive for the carrier because it doesn't take as long. I don't have to drive to Coleman to, you know, go to the hearing or whatever. And it's very efficient. And so I think they recognize that. It saves everybody time and money. And so I would say now 95% of the settlements are done through an ombudsman over the telephone. And it just, it's a very quick process. The claimants like it because it's quicker. They get their check quicker. It's just, it's just a, 
it's a win-win situation, I think, for everybody. So that's how most settlements are done now. They do have 60 days to challenge the settlement um, for fraud or mistake. There's certain, I think there are two other reasons that they can, they can challenge the settlement. In 20, over 20 years, I've only happened, had that happen one time, and there's a case uh, that deals with that that um, you know, does allow them to challenge it, but um, it's just very rare that that ever happens. You can use them as mediators. Um, I mean, when I first started, uh, I mean, we probably had five ombudsmen maybe split throughout the state, if maybe that many. So mm -hmm. it's technically growing. They're adding more and more um, because of how busy they are and the and the work that's needed. So um, I enjoy. I mean, I definitely recommend it. Um, I think they explain everything to the claimant. They also have numbers to the state. I use this resource regularly when claimants have questions or you know just just not sure about things or not sure about what I'm telling them about their benefits or anything like that um, you know I tell them all the time I mean I've told them I said hey I, I represent your employer I, I technically don't represent you I understand your questions and your concerns what I'd recommend is that you call the state of Alabama call this number they have someone there who will speak to the claimant and explain all of their work comp rights to them. It's a neutral party. So, you know, instead of trying to, for, you know, run them off to an attorney, definitely recommend, you know, give them that number to the state and say, hey, you know, if you just want to talk to somebody about what I'm telling you is right, you know, or whatever, just have that extra value. And believe it or not, your claimants appreciate that. Um, they appreciate that you, you're kind of recognizing you know, their doubts, you know, with them and giving them that other opportunity so they don't have to run to an attorney, so. And that number is in the handout uh, attached with the, where that color coded, you know, map of Alabama is. Um, but Dana said something that I thought I need to reiterate because I, I wasn't clear on this at first, but the ombudsman can do really two different things. They can just help you mediate a case. So you've got to the point where you're ready to try to resolve it they can sit down and do a physical mediation. They'll come to your office, um, you know, sit down and do a, do a mediation of the case. And then they can also approve the settlement or sign off and make the settlement binding once you've reached a settlement. So, you know, typically the way that would work is they come in, you mediate the case, you reach an agreement, and then later you would do that telephonic benefit review conference where you're on the phone and it's getting approved. So it would get, gives me time to have to prepare the settlement documents. And, and you know submit those to everybody and let the plaintiff and their attorneys sign them and things like that so that's it's a good point they, they can do both mediations and approvals so they, they kind of do two different things so your, your defense attorney you know you have a bigger case or whatever y'all want to mediate they may tell you you know hey let's go to Gerald Stringer who's one of our ombudsmen has been around for a long time love Gerald um, work, yes Yes, we, I mean, I do those, I probably have three of them this week where they're, they're not represented. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so we'll, so, you know, maybe Dana's had a case that she's resolved with a pro se claimant. Um, she'll send me the, you know, the basic information. I'll prepare the settlement documents and then I'll reach out and I speak directly to the claimant and explain my role, confirm that in an email, um, send them the documents. They literally sign the documents. If they have the capability to scan an email, they scan them, email them back to me. If they don't, they can just stick them in the mail back to me. Once I get that, then we set up a, a benefit review conference over the phone, and you're done. So you can you can use the use use it for pro se claimants. Mm -hmm. You can still do it. You don't have to have an attorney. The only time that I would involve maybe if, if maybe the client wants the attorney, uh, a defense attorney to always be involved um, for some reason and want that documentation. But those are the, the ombudsman, clients. yeah. <laughs> those <laughs> are the smart clients. <laughs> the ombudsman have their own documents, like a, a memorandum agreement, affidavit. They write it all up, draw it up, and everybody signs. So um, you don't have to have legal draft paperwork. Maybe I want 
because the claim was a little stickier and I'm closing medical and it's for a larger amount, maybe I want to just really nail it home with more legal documentation, and then I can have um, a you know, defense attorney actually draft the paperwork, but we still, instead of avoiding the court, pro you know, doing the court process, we still go through the ombudsman program, but just have more formalized paperwork that's gonna outline specifics I want outlined. Um, then I could go to them for that. So. Okay, workers' compensation, medical set aside. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, well, I. <laughs> Um, you well, know, well, I, MSAs and Medicare is not a fun topic for anybody for that matter. I mean, if you've got questions, I'd say see me later, but basically, there's an exam rep, um, exam works rep upstairs, I'd say go to them. Um, basically, <laughs> you, you can't close medical benefits and then push the um, responsibility for that treatment on Medicare, okay? So the way you, you avoid that is you you carve out a part of the settlement through a Medicare set aside. It's a way to just put money aside to, to, for their medical care. And you can show, okay, we're closing medical benefits on this, but we're not gonna send them to Medicare to get their treatment. We're gonna put money in this pile over here and it's gonna be reserved for them to get their treatment. And they have to, they have to go through that money and pay for it before Medicare would consider paying for any treatment for them. And it's, more complicated than that, or it can be, but most everybody and you know, the companies that you work for will have a, what I call an MSA vendor. Mm -hmm. They'll have a vendor that, that is very knowledgeable and, and, and typically I'll be working with that vendor. I'll prepare the settlement documents and there'll be things that, you know, they'll prepare and, um, but that's the gist of it. So you're, you, you know, you can't settle the future medical benefits and just push that medical on Medicare where they're going to go to Medicare and get all their treatment. Medicare doesn't like that. So um, that's kind of what a Medicare set aside is. You're just setting that money aside to pay for their treatment through work comp um, mm -hmm. and not push that off onto Medicare. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Okay. Yeah, you do have certain thresholds. Um, financially speaking, those are all listed on there. Um, we can ask questions about any of that if you may have a specific question. There's nothing special about Medicare in Alabama. I guess, so to speak. I think it's same across the board. That's right. Um, litigation, lawsuits. All right, so. You're up. Yeah, so um, potential causes of litigation. I think, Dana, actually, you put some of these together just and you see these coming up. So there's a legitimate dispute between the parties as to the compensability of the claim, um, medic medical necessity, you know, things like that. So, you know, they go file a suit. Um, you know, um, employee gets mad for some reason, thinks the adjuster doesn't like them or the doctor's not treating them fairly. You know, that can push them to go file a lawsuit. Um, the claim's been denied, obviously. I mean, that'll obviously push people to go file a lawsuit and get a lawyer. Treatment is denied. Um, they're upset about being returned to work. They think they're returned to work too soon. You know, that may push them to go, um, you know, hire a lawyer and file a lawsuit. Um, the employer can't accommodate the the restrictions and they don't like that and they are maybe confused about that and they go file a lawsuit. Um, they get terminated. Uh, that's a whole nother thing that we're not, that's a whole nother day, another topic. Um, they're dissatisfied with their medical treatment or their impairment rating or the amount of money that was offered to be settled. They all thought of those it things. was going to be their payday and they were going to retire. Right. <laughs> a lot of times we will see like there's some influential person like a, a, a spouse or a hammer a friend or a cousin or somebody that maybe had a claim and they got this out of it and if they're not going to offer you this well then you know that can drive them into a lawsuit and then of course you know we see a lot of you know ads you know tv if you turn on the tv every morning you see them you know Sonora. plaintiff attorneys right yeah hammer yeah. The alabama there, hammer yeah there, there are a lot of them so um those are all reasons that kind of can end up where you're then you've got a you had a claim and now you got a lawsuit um Who can file litigation and workers' compensation claims? Um, well, typically, obviously, you always see the plaintiff, the claimant, the employee. They're the ones filing the lawsuit. But in Alabama, you can, I can initiate the lawsuit. And, and we do that when it's strategically advantageous for us to do that. And so, for example, 
if I have a claim that I think is questionable and we're going to deny the claim, and I, I, and it just happens to work out where maybe there are two or three venues that could be proper, I'm going to go ahead and file suit against the employee saying there's a dispute about whether we owe this claim and judge, we want you to hold a, have a trial and tell us whether we owe this or not. And I'm going to pick the best venue for me. So that's, that's a, you know, again, another strategy. If, if you're, um, there are three different proper venues, I'm going to try to determine the bit one, maybe this best for my client. And, and on a disputed claim like that, I may go ahead and file suit to kind of beat them to it. So that's sometimes you hear that called a jumpsuit. Um, you talk about the venue. Can you say venue? I think I say venue, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the whole thing. You're yeah, trying to um, kind of determine what the best venue. Um, receipt of a workers' compensation lawsuit by the employer. Um, so your employer will get, you know, a lawsuit, and typically the way they get there served by the lawsuit. Some of this stuff you all already probably know, but, um, you know, um, you want them to then make sure that they, you know, if you see something's coming, you say, hey, look, if you get these papers, please call me. Dana will say, please call me and let me know. Make sure that you let us know that we're served. And sometimes maybe I'm already involved, and I'll tell them that, be on the lookout. If you get served, please let us know. Get it to us as soon as possible. Um, and talk about selection of a defense attorney. Um, I don't really, we don't think we have to get into that. Um, but obviously, if there's a lawsuit involved, you want to get an attorney involved. Um, and then one of the things that I'm, the first things I'm thinking about is, you know, I've got 30 days to file an answer or file a responsive pleading. Um, and so that's something when service is important for me because I have 30 days from the date they're served. And so I'm kind of tracking that and uh, making sure that, um, you know, we're, we've got that calendar that are, are filing it in a timely manner. Sometimes, you know, the first notice of the claim is Dana gets the lawsuit, you know, and maybe, um, the, you know, maybe her, her insurer didn't tell them about it until three weeks after they got served. So we're kind of in a crunch at that point. So sometimes, you know, you have to reach out to the other side to get an extension to file a response, to file an answer to the complaint, things like that. Those are just, you know, it's one of the things that's kind of on your radar right off the bat is making sure you've got that dialed in in terms of getting your answer filed. Um, looks like we got 10, 10 minutes. Um, initial action required by defense attorney in a work comp lawsuit. Um, so we just talked about that. The first thing is I want to file the answer within 30 days. Um, you want to make sure you cover your affirmative defenses. Um, things like what some of the things we talked about, like the statute of limitations, things like that. You want to make sure you include those in your answer so you're not waiving those. Um, venue is another issue. You want to make sure that they filed it in the proper venue. Sometimes they'll try to sneak it in a venue that's more favorable for them, and, and they really, it shouldn't be in that venue. So you, instead of filing an answer, you're asking the court to transfer to the proper venue. That's, you know, not uncommon. I mean, you know, you, you have to really be mindful and watch and make sure they've got it uh, in the proper venue. Because that is, like I said, I think one of the first things I said, it's, you know, knowing who the judge and what venue you're in is one of the most important things in a work comp case. Um, you know, so you, you really need to make sure you're in the best available venue that you can be in for your client. Um, Sometimes you'll get a lawsuit in that will have other claims like, you know, count one, work comp, count two, negligence for a car, you know, some type of car wreck, count three, a retaliatory discharge claim. So um, when you have that, you need to kind of get guidance from your attorneys as to what to do with those claims. And, and we talked a little bit about coverage. Generally speaking, just the work comp came, claim would be covered under the work comp policy. The other claims would not be covered, so that's something you should need to be be aware of. And typically, you might have to get a, you might need to get coverage counsel involved to make sure you don't owe any defense on those other claims. Um, you know, these are just basic things. The attorney needs to respond to the plaintiff's interrogatories. Um, you know, we need to file interrogatories. We do that in every case. You know, we're going to file interrogatories and a request for production of documents to the other side. 
And then something that I think is real important, and I'm sure most lawyers do this, but from the very beginning, I want to get the claim file. I want to analyze all the facts. I want to realize, I mean, I want to figure out what part of, what legal issues, I want to identify those legal issues. Are there defenses that we could bring here? Um, you know, what are, what are the legal issues where we could fight the compensability of this claim? And so after I get all that information, I'm going to put it in what I call an initial case evaluation where I'm going to lay out the facts to you. Here are the facts. Here are the legal issues that we're going to be dealing with. And then kind of uh, typically if, if they've already been at MMI and there's been a rating, I'm going to do calculations. I'm going to do the initial calculations to give you some idea about what kind of the potential exposure might be on this claim. And that can also help you with your reserves when you're trying to set your reserves mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, I'm going to lay all that out in that initial evaluation. It kind of gives us a roadmap and a thing that we can use to kind of throughout the case. And then, you know, once we take the deposition, we would update that and, you know, update the issues. Okay, well, this defense is not good anymore. We've decided we're not going to be, but this one has been strong. And, you know, we've got these other facts that are going to make that, uh, that defense stronger than we thought we were. Um, outrage lawsuits, who something you don't want to see. Um, you know, Sometimes we will see outrage lawsuits. Has anybody heard of an outrage lawsuit? Okay, I see some, some heads nodding. Y'all are hanging on. Um, um, it, it's, the bar is very high on outrage lawsuits. It's hard to prove those cases, but they, you still have to defend them. So you, you, know, you as an adjuster don't wanna be brought into an outrage case. You're, you know, you're carrier doesn't want you involved in an outrage case. The case nurse doesn't want to be in an outrage case. So, you know, the way you avoid that is going back to what Dana said is that from one of the first things she said is that when you're handling a claim and you're putting notes in the claim file, act like the plaintiff's attorney or is watching you. He can see what you're putting in that claim file. It's not that stupid, you know, claimant, claimant is so dumb, he's been bothering the heck out of me, and I'm not gonna offer him anything on this case. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they will, they, those things are discoverable in an outrage case. Everybody thinks, well, they can't get my claim notes, but in an outrage case, they can get your claim notes. Mm -hmm. So, you, it's real important just to make sure you're putting that in like the plaintiff attorney is, can see everything you're doing. You know, just be mindful and keep that in the back of your mind. So outrage lawsuits, something you definitely want to avoid. And the way to avoid that is just to try to, you know, document your file properly, treat the claimant fairly, you know, things like that. No, it, they have. I mean, it, I mean you can be sued, can yes, be, personally, but, but generally, you know, in terms of insurance, you should have some kind of coverage to, yeah. to defend you for that through your company. But they, they would, yes, I've seen adjusters named individually in outrage cases mm -hmm. um, and case nurses in outrage cases. Case nurse is a big thing, um, making sure that you're using people who are good, ethical. Um, if they've got something to tell you, if they've got an opinion, make sure they're picking up the phone to tell you that and not telling you in writing. And it can be as simple as, you know, I think he's lying or I'm thinking, you know, that he's fraud. I had one in Mississippi just because, and she got brought into it because she put in there, you know, I, th I think that he's fraud. And, you know, case nurses are actually supposed to be a new, I mean, they're supposed to be an advocate for the claimant. They're not supposed to be for you. Um, and so it, it's very, and, and that's been something that's big in Alabama or with some of, you know, attorneys, depends on what attorney it is, and making sure that you're using, you know, right, the case nurses are operating the way that they're supposed to be operating, which is to the favor of the claimant. And case nurses can get in a lot of trouble if they're not. They're not supposed to be, you know, appearing like they're, you know, go into the bat for for the insurance company you know with the doctor and fighting for you and you know convincing the doctor hey do this you know i mean everybody should be operating on on, on moral ground but if they you know obviously you've got opinions obviously they if they're going to the appointments they see things and they can see discrepancies in behaviors and stuff like that so Good just make bad. sure it's yeah uh just make sure that it, it's a phone call and if something needs to be updated in your file just be very careful you know in how you're wording that um 
you know, or just keep it. Sometimes we do have to keep things in the back of our mind and maybe not put them in a file, just depending on what they are. But Okay, we've got like three minutes or something like that. Technically, left, it's so. 11.50 is the end. Okay. I know, I was oh, enjoying okay. watching how fast you were well, going. Well, now can I do it now? <laughs> I, well, I, I thought it was 11.30. No, but we can, we can get a, a little bit early. Well, I um, mean, it's hard to say, okay, yeah. we're going to be gone, and then everybody's like, yeah, and then they're like, no, we got to stay till 11.50. I know. Uh, well, gonna, well, let's just let's just questions. do this. Let's yeah, let's let's do some questions and see if anybody has any questions. And I think we've kind of covered. And y'all can look of it. over the PPD ratings and the eight. You know, if anybody has any, I know we didn't talk about like how to calculate PPD, PTD. Obviously, that's different in Alabama. If you've never done Alabama versus other states, um, because of the the cap. So the body as a whole is worth 300 weeks of benefits. Um, we do get to take credit for uh, the TTD paid, which is obviously nice that you have 300 weeks and you get to take credit for that. And then if you settle in a lump sum, which I always would, because you, if you don't, you extend your statute of limitations out, um, you know, then you can take like a 6% offset. So a lot of those are, are all in there, um, but you know, I don't know if anybody has any questions about Alabama ratings, TTD, PPD. Question here. Okay, let's make sure I understand. So your question is, in, in Georgia, PPD is, is automatic and they, they just initiate those payments on a weekly basis? Okay, so, so in Alabama, um, typically, I mean, they're entitled to that, but I know what you're saying. I never see anybody, and Dana, you may speak to this more, but that just, I've had one client in 20 something years that did that and, and what would happen was you'd pay this PPD out and then you'd pay it out and then they would file suit and then they're still claiming that 10% PPD or more, you know? So you've kind of paid all that money out statute. and then they still want it again, if that makes sense. I mean, you can, obviously we would argue, well, hold on a second, we've already compensated you for this 10% PPD, but he's saying, well, yeah, but I've got a 40%, you know? And so you're still arguing kind of over the same thing. So I don't recommend that. I mean, I think the thing to do is once you get that rating, you want to try to talk to them about resolving the claim on a lump sum basis. I mean, that's what I would recommend in Alabama that you do. So Alabama is still, we're still very old school, so we still go off the fourth edition AMA. Um, most of your doctors know that, but you should always check that medical record to make sure when they say what, where their rating came from that they use the fourth edition. Um, and if they don't specify, ask. Um, as far as if you know the claimant had a fracture and underwent, you know, internal fixation and all of that, um, I mean, I would always ask the doctor to specifically address MMI and address whether or not he's got a rating. I don't think that you have to ask that for every claim. Um, if you've got a med only claim that never went lost time and, you know, the doctor didn't address whether or not he had a rating, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hunt it down. Um, you know, so like in Tennessee, we have a lot of times we have to get that C30 from doctors, which specifies, but you know, and in other states, the same. But in Alabama, I wouldn't, if he doesn't address it, um, I wouldn't ask it unless to me, because I think it's you know, to me, it kind of comes to an ethical thing. There's nothing by law that says we have to have the doctor, you know, um, you have to have MMI address. But if you have an accident that's got a break and that required surgery or, you know, something like that, I would, I would send a letter and make sure that he's addressing whether or not there was a rating. I mean, if your employer wants you to do it or, or doesn't want you to do it and you don't feel like there's you know, I mean, I, I guess you, I don't think that there's anything that says that you have to ask for it. But again, if you have a guy who's got a back surgery, I mean, I guess the question is down the road, are you going to have, are you going to be trying to defend that to a plaintiff attorney that says, you know, well, you know, he had a three level fusion. I mean, well, on what grounds did you think he wasn't going to be entitled to an impairment rating or a settlement? So. I mean, most cases you're going to, the, the, the authorized doctor is going to just tell you either 
it's a 10%, it's a 0%, you know, and I've had them. They'll say, okay, release to return, full duty, no restrictions, 0% PPI rating, you know, or whatever it is. So I would say, at least in my experience, it may just be that it's just the Kate claims I'm seeing is, you know, some things don't get to me, but, you know, um, they're gonna ha they're gonna give you an impairment rating if one is warranted, and then you would work off of that. I mean, you kind of are re you're you're depending on the authorized doctor to tell you whether there's a rating or not. And if mm -hmm. they ignore it, I mean, again, if it's a three level fusion and they ignore it, I mean, that's one thing. Right. And I mean, you you know that person's going to have some type of a permanent impairment. But if it's just a run of the mill, you know, broken arm or a burn or something, you know, I mean, you're thinking, okay, well, they may not have any. And sometimes maybe they would, but it wouldn't shock you if they didn't have an impairment rating. Then, um, you know, I, I, the doctor, if he doesn't, if he doesn't address it, to me that means well, then Must he didn't think there was an impairment rating here. Yeah. And you know, sometimes it may be necessary to clarify that, but I would say most of the time, the doctors are going to tell you what you need to know on that, yeah. at least in my experience. And you do have a, a lot of attachments back here. Um, a lot are pulled from the state of Alabama, basic cl claim handling definitions. It's also got your, which a lot of people get them in the cheat sheets and you'll get them upstairs. It's got your average weekly wage, max, minimum, the mileage, the um, mortality table, um, and then also like the schedule member body parts and what each week is worth. Um, you know, Alabama is not a body, you know, we do have scheduled members here, so um, when it comes to that and, you know, getting a claim outside of, you know, a, if an injury was to the leg and it's to the meniscus, but they're trying to, you know, doctor or even plaintiff attorneys trying to take it outside of that schedule, everything should be to the leg. You shouldn't be operating any kind of body as a whole if you've got a knee meniscal tear. Um, same goes, like, a lot of people doctors will do if they got an amputation of the index finger. A doctor will do an index finger rating, a hand rating, and an arm rating, and maybe even body as a whole rating. Um, personally speaking, when we have like a, a finger or something, a finger is a finger, and the rating should be to the finger. Um, maybe can go to the hand, but you know, I don't really know if it applies to the arm. It definitely doesn't apply to the body as a whole. So. Um, those can get kind of tricky, you know, in Alabama. Um, people want to take things out of the schedule, which is a, you know, there's a lot of burden for that. Obviously, there's a pain exception burden and stuff to try to get a scheduled member out, outside of the schedule on a body. Does anybody have any questions yep. for us? Any, yep. In terms of subrogation, yep. is Alabama or other um, underlying negligence, is it a comparative state or is it just really negligent? There's no comparative no negligence in Alabama. Contrib. Anything else? Any other questions? I will say before we leave, um, last year at least, they sent me a list of everybody that had signed up, and I, I just sent an email to the group with an attachment of the handout, you know, just so I know you've got it here and you're obviously welcome. Please take it with you. But um, so I, I will try to do that. If they send me everybody's email and list, I'll shoot you an email with this, you know, in a, in a, um, you know, digital, you know, format. So, um, and, you know, Dana's name, my name and number and everything's on here. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to call us if you have any questions about anything. And um, thank you all for coming. We appreciate y'all bearing through this cold, cold thank room. So thank you all. Thank you.